So we're going to start with Richard. Yep. Going to talk more about, well, I guess, in Western migration patterns and cooperation. Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Walwick. I am a well, I present research and present information for the think tank. Uh, very brief rundown of qualifications: student of geology, which gives me a long-term time preference; history, which is you could argue is the prehistory and recorded history. We're going to go into a bit of prehistory in this. Uh, and then politics, which gives us the immediate, or like the short term time preference. So what we're going to do is we're going to give everybody a framework of what's common across, well we could say all humanity, but then we're going to follow specifically the uh, story of the hunter-gatherers that went to Europe. And they result in something called the Western hunter-gatherer that everybody I presume in this room has some descent from in some way, shape or form. So the title of the lecture is Group Cooperation, How Nature Taught Us to Survive. One of the main issues, so let's begin, uh, what makes hominids different to the animals around them? So there's extensive lists about like, how we are so unique, but we can kind of break this down into, apart from fire, clothing and art, all hominids are still scavengers rather than hunter-gatherers. The animals themselves are scavengers, a lot of them are. So, um, example, carrion crows. You know, I admit they might get the odd little animal, but they mainly spend the time eating on carcasses. Now, if we're looking at two things that slightly make, uh, I would call it now, we're looking at what makes the animals different than us, but there are still two things the animals actually do that we do. One of the things is tool use. Now, I know there's a hyperlink up there, I will show you it to prove I'm not lying to you. Chimpanzees in both crow culture can make tools. Now obviously they're not multi-stage tools, it's not like you're putting a spearhead on a stick or something. But monkeys have been observed in parts of chimpanzees in Africa. Uh, there'll be various like, monkey families and each one will have a unique way of crushing nuts. Some of them will use a stick, bashing it, other ones will use a rock. What we find is, is though, not all the monkeys are using the same tool use. Every little group will be using it in a different way. Now they're clearly learning this from someone else. They're clearly looking at the family members, the other troop, and they're taking this information in. Now obviously because of the lack of, how do you call it now, communication skills like we have, the ability to transfer this knowledge, it's not going in massive jumps. It's not like we're getting massive technological advances. Now, one of the things is that were quite funny, I'll see if this link actually works, bear with the audience, just to prove I'm not lying. Now, if I'm going to ask you which would make better tools, is it monkeys or crows? This, it's not come up on screen. Yeah, click escape. Click escape. Mm. No, it's not doing it. But anyway, right, so there's an article I'm going to cut short on the hyperlink just to prove I'm not lying. It is the idea that, yeah, um, the idea is if we see in this picture here, for instance, we see crows using tools. Now, when we actually look at how complicated these tools are, they all have a different use. Some crows will be using it to go down into the wood and like pull something out like a hook. Other ones will be using it as a spear. And what we find with crows specifically is they're very, very good at task specialising a tool. Now, these aren't multi-stage tools, but they're still a tool for each use. Tool use, we've clearly proved that um, monkeys can do it and crows can do it. So that doesn't make tool use unique to our culture. Another aspect is, is, now I don't like using the word morality, but we use it, so we'll use it. Um, right and wrong, good and bad. I mean, these are terms that are kind of subjective, aren't they? But regarding morality, there's an interesting thing regarding chimpanzees and both crows as well. They can deceive, but they can cooperate together. Now, an example of this is uh, with the certain birds in Africa where they have a symbiotic relationship with meerkats. So what the meerkats do is they go out, catch a scorpion, and they get nutrients from it. Now, what they're relying on is the bird being an alarm call system. The bird itself is able to say, oh, predators are coming, everyone get back to your burrow. So the meerkats know that that certain noise the crow makes means get, get out of dodge, get in the bunker. The crow has figured, well, the, the bird has figured out, if he can tell the truth nine times out of ten, the animals will fall for a lie one times out of ten. Because if you're surviving by listening to this noise, you're going to take that noise seriously. It's like if the fire alarm went off. We wouldn't all just sit here and think, I'm sure it's that lie that he said, we'd have to take it seriously. So we find that these meerkats will bring out the food, the animal will make an alarm call, they'll leave the food, and the bird enjoys its food. One of the issues with this is we've proven that certain animals can deceive. 
they are capable of lying. So we've got tool use and the ability to lie that both animals have. So the example I've got in the pictures is obviously crows making tools, but there's something else here uh, in this slide. This is obviously an Arabic rendition of it, but it's called a crow cullet. I don't know if any of you have ever heard about this. Anybody who lives in cities, really, that you'll ever see it. You have to go out into nature to see this. You'll see a crow, and it'll be stood there on its own, looking guilty. It clearly has done something wrong. You'll find there's three forms of justice that they seem to enact. So, if you've stolen food from a baby bird, they will steal your feathers. They'll make you a baby bird, which is a death sentence. Uh, the other thing that they'll do, uh, compensation. This is something you think is unique to humans. Crows do this as well. If I'm a crow and I damage a nest, I have to build it back up again to the same standard that the crow built it. If you steal food off a female bird, it's an instant death penalty. And you'll see, as in this picture, the crow stood there and everybody else judging it. Now, some people even think that, like, well, this isn't real, but uh, a lot of, again, anybody who's an urbanite or lives in urban areas will not see this. You have to go into the wild to see these things. So we've already proved that tool use and morality seems to be something that animals also have. So our next slide, what changed, though, about this? So we are just like the animals. We're still subject to living within nature. Stage one of this, despite let, uh, we let nature be our teacher. So at some point, we're thinking maybe around the time of Homo erectus, because these people are still scavengers. This is like a million BC. So we're not, we're not into modern humanity yet. Uh, they were no more than scavengers. They would run over to a carcass, maybe scare off some other animals, maybe not. But they, let's like, say, if a pride of lions comes, you get a dodge. You've not got the ability to combat them. But what the Homo erectus would probably notice is after a while, despite the lack of tools, tool use in lions and wolves, they operate as a pride in a pack. They're able to leverage the individual strength of one with many by cooperating. So, don't get me wrong, a lion's strong on its own, but a pride lions can take like a buffalo, big, bigger animals like megafauna. Any high trust members of, the, of any hominid group would try and replicate what they've seen. So instead of just running out on your own trying to get some meat, maybe a few of you, maybe you, because obviously these are extended family groups, this isn't like strangers are coming over, anybody who was beginning to operate in a high trust world would begin working as a pack. One of the th key things is though, lions hunt at night, and also because they are feline, they have a difference compared to wolves. Wolves operate during the day, but they're also, strangely enough, we have, like we said here in slide two, an unintended consequence of, oh hang on, so, so any hydrous members of the group would try and replicate what they've seen using the tools that are specialised rather than rush the carcass and ward them off. So as the crow and the monkey does makes a tool that is specialised, we can use this specialised tool to look as a group, rush the carcass, scare things off. Now one of these things is wolves are also, I mean they can hunt but they will scavenge if need be. One of the things about the wolf is, and it's an unintended consequence of being in close proximity to one, the competitor became a companion. So I've got to drink a water on it. So the competitor becomes a panion. How does this happen? There's a chemical in mammals called oxytocin. Now this occurs naturally in all animals and it's related to social ability. One of the things about the wolf is, is if let's say anomaly wise or a mutation, a wolf had more oxy uh, oxytocin than its friend, that one would be more sociable. So we're not saying immediately they'd come over and go, being friends with you, but they'd be less proximity of it. Like some dogs today, for instance, you can tell its attitude, its ears rise up, it's clearly in threat defence mode. It's not like laying down being submissive to you. So what would have happened over time, the more the wolves that seem to have a high level of oxytocin would have therefore become more um, interacted more with humans. And as time went on, some of these animals would have probably become, not necessarily living with us, but in close proximity so that our lives overlapped. So one thing that begins happening with this is that the, the, over time, the ones that are more close to us begin breeding with those that have had this higher level of chemical in the brains, and this makes the wolf immediately higher of sociability than the lion. What then also happens is with this, now something that's unique to wolves and dogs in general, they can read facial expressions. So I keep birds and stuff, 
but the bird can never, you know, it knows my face, but it can never read my attitude. Like, to a bird, it's not very different. You can smile at a bird, it's not very different. A wolf can just tell from your facial expressions what your attitude is, or like what your view is towards it. So because of this then, there was an immediate synergy between us. The animal then would know, like, oh, stay away or come nearer. So that's, and again, like I say, what started off as a, com a competitor, over time became a companion. What we would have done as, as well is, like I say, if we watched the wolf and the lion teach us how to hunt, but one thing is that they would have done is, is show us how to range, how to go further. One thing that the wolf does as well is he marks his territory. As soon as he realises maybe there's another pack of wolves who are more stronger than us, they'll just mark the territory and say this is ours. We started getting the idea of like hunting ranges of humans. So it's not just necessarily original, like, oh well, is there an animal I need to get it? You might be straying into someone else's territory who also had wolves. So you could even argue, like, yeah, admittedly, geography does determine certain boundaries, but likewise, there's certain boundaries that seem almost like arbitrary. Why? Probably because the wolf originally would have gone, I'm not going beyond that point. So then these humans will, you know, <laughs> following similar uh, track. So the next thing is, is, we've already learned that nature taught us by watching the wolf. Stage two of this is bird watching. So we know now from slide, previous slide, how to operate as a pack and cooperate to, to get prey. How do we then improve upon this? Stage two is bird watching. So eagles and hawks are ambush predators, uh, while crows and carrion, like I said earlier, are scavengers, similar to the hominid. The talons of a bird, though, are tiny compared to like the claws of a wolf or the teeth of a bear, yet the tiny bird can still take down prey. So for example, if you watch hawks flying around, you'll see the small animal able to like, leverage its speed and its tiny talons, but to take down prey bigger than it. That's what we call ambush predators. So that's a lot different than a scavenger. Someone at some point would have noticed this and noticed that the bird has an advantage. He can fly, which is impossible for us. We would have obviously revered this animal because he's very different than us, but one thing we would have done is, is try and replicate that same thing. Like, how do we make things fly? So we've already got a spear for stabbing someone. I can throw a spear. But what would have more than likely happened is the cumbersome hand-throwing spears were reduced in size and incorporating aspects of the bird itself, the feathers. So these become flight feathers. There's actually a mathematical equation to this. There's only so big an arrow can be before it's useless. Um, and you don't see massive arrows. You always see the earlier arrows really reduced in size. Now, we don't see any shafts for early archaeology of arrows. We're only going off arrow heads. And we can clearly tell that... Um, we, 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 the only use really flint for arrowheads. So even though primitive man is seen to be, okay man, renowned for using flint, specialised wise, it's really for arrowheads. Now, so therefore they've, they've turned the spear into an arrow by trying to replicate the bird flying and reducing its size. Now one thing the bird also does, birds are noticeable for singing and warning other species. So like I said earlier on, with the meerkat, uh, symbiosis with the, the birds in Africa, the alarm warning. One thing then they would have done is, is well, because bird, other animals make noise, but only birds sing. So what we think would have happened is, and the evidence of this is a bit later on in Europe, the first example of musical instruments, they hollow out vulture bones. And, because bird bones are hollow, which is quite a useful thing. Put holes in it, they try to replicate the bird noise. So we have the beginnings of musical instruments beginning. So we get birds not all singing in one of the species using the hollow bones of birds. Flutes can be fashioned to replicate the sounds of the animals and coordinate the wolf pack hunt. So rather than just all shout to each other, Oi, let's go and hunt this, this, this animal, you could be on the other side of the valley, play a certain tune, let other people know, like the bird has an alarm system, we would have developed our own. We would have developed almost like a language in music. You know, so example, like in Scotland, the, the bagpipe players, uh, to an Englishman it just sounds like music and noise. To Scottish people, certain songs mean certain ideas. So one of the concepts was in uh, Scotland, it says, well, 12 men in a pair of bagpipes is rebelling in the making. All they needed to do, we saw this in Lithuania as well, they had the musical bagpipe instruments, and they were saying more than likely it's not just for making noise and entertainment, it's to communicate with other groups. You're able then, using this, it's almost like a primitive early version of the internet or the telephone music. You're able then across entire stretches of distance to warn people of danger or encourage them to help you out. 
So we've watched pack hunting and we've also done bird watching. So then the third thing is, um, so if we've got the basics of a, the beginnings of becoming more than scavengers, we're beginning to become hunters. So this process originally, obviously, like we were talking from Homo erectus all the way through to like Homo habilogensis, early, so for example, like Neanderthals are not necessarily hunters, they're still scavengers in their own way. They're not as, even though they're around at the same time as hunter-gatherers, well, a bit earlier, uh, they're nowhere near as advanced. Their toolkits are very, very primitive, uh, which are obviously a lot more advanced. So, now, don't get me wrong, humans, probably 100,000 BC, the modern anatomical human is sort of in its modern form. It wasn't until something our first test as humans came around in 70,000 BC. So, in the island of Sumatra, there was one of the biggest recorded of all time super volcano explosions. It's called the catastrophe theory holds that this event caused a severe global volcanic winter of six to ten years. Six to ten years today, imagine in our agricultural societies if we had no sun for six to eight years, we're going to starve to death. Our entire modern farming world would just collapse. These hunter-gatherers were put through a massive bottleneck. So we find this from the genetic information as well. We notice, uh, imagine it like a tree. Uh, if you've ever seen gardeners cut the tree off when it regrows, there's not the exact same amount of branches, there's just a few of them. So what we find is, is uh, six to ten years of this environment contributed to a thousand year long period of cooling. So our entire world around us has changed, especially in Africa where we started off in the, in the Rift Valley. Even though this is in Sumatra, it's still affecting environments as far, like it's a global issue. All humans are descended from this time, because it causes a bottleneck, between 1,000 and 10,000 breeding pairs. So everybody in this room and everybody on the planet is literally descended from this small group of people. We find this as well through the genetic information of certain diseases that seem to appear. Why have we got a preclivity? Now obviously I'm not offending the audience, whoever's listening, but we have certain conditions today. We have things like schizophrenia, we have things like, like I suppose like autism, other things like that. Uh, you name your thing that doesn't really fit into the modern world. Why is it still there? Wouldn't, in the past, wouldn't people who had these conditions, like, well, it wouldn't make you the most effective hunter, would it? Why are they still there? There must have been something regarding them ailments that would have proved beneficial to the group. Otherwise, you'd be something called dead weight. If you're not able to help in a situation, then you're just an extra mouth to feed. For some reason, like I said, we can just tell directly just by how many genetic issues we have as a species. And also our illnesses, for instance, we're not actually genetically... We're so genetically narrow that our, um, we're very susceptible to certain diseases as a species. It's just part of how it is. So all humans are descended from this 10,000 breeding pairs. It's also evident in the animal kingdom. It's just like a tree where they've cut it and then it regrows again. There's only a few branches. So we can safely say that this was a bottleneck time period. After this event, though, human technology and genetics seems to follow a pattern, an improvement to what came prior before. So 70,000 BC, the entire world is changing. Even though it's only like 10 years, that's like a lifetime for some people, the thousand year knock-on effect was disastrous for the human group. So for instance, we see there's like Homo erectus in Asia, he seems to disappear. We have uh, the Neanderthals in Europe, they don't seem to be uh, prospering to the same degree as other cultures do later on. So on the next slide. So during this tour disaster, like I mentioned, about the concept of dead weight how we domesticated ourselves. So it, this, is, um, it's not, this is not necessarily survival of the fittest, this becomes something else. Compared to Neanderthals, now, is there a slide up? I think it's on the next one, I'll just show you briefly. We have here a modern anatomical human, Cro-Magnon. This beast here, he's called a Neanderthal. Now, as we can see, there's a massive difference here. The jaw is a big indication. Uh, and his brow ridges. Notice this, this implies a very violent culture he's coming from. Homo erectus had a similar thing as well. They were saying the men and the women, there's no sexual dimorphism, they think very similar, and they've all got really big brow ridges. Bash, it's a world where you club each other over that. It's one of those kind of worlds. This is a similar world he's coming from. One of the main differences is why this is happening. Let's go back to the previous thing. It's related to testosterone. Now, antisocial behaviour, uh, is, common fact, is linked to high testosterone levels. 
Now, antisocial behaviour leads to a lack of less reciprocity and less success in group coordination. If we're working together as a sociable group, we can leverage our strength and succeed. The more antisocial people would have bred less, there'd have been less ability to succeed. Now, it's not mentioned here on the slide, but there is evidence of this in Africa. So there was an archaeological dig going on, and they kept finding obsidian beads, little tiny beads with a hole through it. No one could understand what this all about. And then they found later on a modern-day human in Africa, this, this African woman, and she had a load of obsidian bead necklace. And it turns out culturally, if you are a good person, how would you call it now? If you help another group out, or if you've uh, proved to be sociable to the help in that other group, they'll give you the special beat that will be marked in a certain way. So let's say we're all out hunting and stuff like that and we all help another group out, they'll give us their set of beads. That means they've got access to the hunting lands. So this is how it works in Africa. Now we presume it would have probably been the same back then. This is behaviour that you should be trying to limit at. You know, you do not want to encourage this. So Neanderthals by virtue cannot compete to the same degree due to their lack of sociability. Therefore the conclusion to this little issue is, is mate selection isn't dependent on how strong you are, it's on how cooperative you are. So remember that human bottleneck from the previous slide, we've got 10,000 people. These were probably the 10,000 people who pulled their weight. They were people who would have maybe naturally had higher <coughs> oxytocin levels, like the wolf. And so for the, therefore they've already got this chemical in their body that will, in a transaction, if you've got high levels of this, you're willing to take less of a reward than other people. So in other words, if there's a transaction, I've got mine, like not getting all the money back, you know, I'm willing to take a bit of a loss on it. We think what would have happened is, is, so example, Neanderthal caves would have been a horrible life for the women and children. We think that the early uh, modern anatomical human women would have purposely wanted someone in the cave who isn't a threat to the children, who can work as a group, who can bring back more food. This then would have made them, uh, would have domesticated ourselves in the process. The women selected people with less testosterone, therefore noticed the Neanderthal jaw compared to others. There seems to be a reduction in size. So primitive anatomical modern humans, still more robust, but as time goes on, the jawline really reduces. So we see that women must be having some say in this. Because normally the survival of the fittest, the strongest survive. No, it's how cooperative you are, it turns out. So there we go, there's the stuck skulls again, just as an example. So here we've got the Exodus period. So obviously, like I was saying, we're 100,000 years ago, we have evolved into the modern anatomical human. Ears of the Rift Valley, uh, what we find out genetically is, is everybody who left Africa, even we're talking from here all the way down to these people, the, the Aborigines, are actually more genetically related and they're very narrow. There isn't actually much, even though there's different skin tones and different looks, genetically not much difference. Yet those who stayed in Africa, those that didn't leave, cycled around. And it turns out, even though obviously Africa would We'd say, well, they've all got dark skin and dark eyes. Technically, they're more genetically diverse than anybody who left. Because the, the group who left was only a small group, the people who stayed. So what happens is, is again, this is a good example. We've got 40,000 uh, BC, so this is the, what we would call the Aurignacian culture, or Cro-Magnon. And down here we have the Aborigine. Remember earlier on when I said we brought, uh, dogs became oh, the wolf. So it's not a domestic dog, it's still a wolf. How he came from a competitor to a companion. We know that the companion to the human, the wolf, is seen here and seen here. One of the problems is, is though, the wolf is useful up here in this environment. He, without him, would have not survived. This is a regression to the mean down here. What we notice as well is, notice with the Aborigines, for instance, like the dark skin colour. Well, why are they dark and we're paler skin? Because in that environment, having light skin is a detriment. You, you're not going to be as productive. The darker the skin you are in Africa, for example, they were saying about colour in humans, it's all based on latitude. So if we put a line on the equator, things that are north of it, when we get into colder conditions, seem to mate select for whiter skin, or at least skin that's uh, not as dark. The reason is, is um, absorbing vitamin D. Also, like I said, blue eyes does come later, but blue eyes are in an environment that's not as bright as Africa, blue eyes are more useful. So in Africa and in the Aborigine world, it may selected for darker skin. Uh, likewise, in Australia, they brought with them the dog. One of the problems in Australia is because it's that of a regression to the mean. 
it's, it's almost like a paradise. You've got uh, flightless birds, fire, you don't need to make it, you get lightning strikes in the shrub bushes. So all the technological advances we made as a species when we got out of Africa were no longer needed in Australia. So it just becomes a regression to the mean. You also find this with the concept of something called a dream time. The history doesn't go back beyond, it just goes back to this uh, early stage, which is nebulous almost. And it's talking about leaving an environment like Africa and going back to one that's similar to it. While us modern Europe, well, while the European agenda is a bit different. Now, you might think, like, why would you come to Europe in the first place? What makes this any better than Africa? So as we say, are we new home? It's a harsh classroom. We came here because it's a hunter's paradise. So as you're chasing the animals, mainly like mammoth and reindeer and things, these things seem to live in a band. As we see here, uh, we've got this cold area here. Uh, mammoths and reindeer would have gone south and then gone north again. Obviously there's animals down here, but the best stuff's up here. This is a hunter's paradise. Um, one of the things is megafauna, like mammoths and stuff, we're talking major calorie levels. And also there's very little competition here. So back in Africa, for instance, and other places as we're leaving, there's, there's competitions. Like in the Middle East, we see this um, like a corridor where we have Neanderthals and Homo sapiens overlapping. Europe is the place you want to be if you're a hunter-gatherer. Less competition from local. There's Neanderthals here, but um, they're in such small numbers. We just, not necessarily steamroll over them, it's a case of they're just not breeding as much as us. So every generation we're surviving more, bringing more genetic information. They, but they're not even replacing the population. We often find Neanderthals potentially three times the yield of being bred on the genetic line. But one of the problems with Europe is, compared to Africa and places, we have ice sheets everywhere. Now, the ice isn't permanent. Wherever the ice is, tends to change. So if we can see in this little bit here, obviously, a long time ago, this is like Homo erectus time, half a million years ago. But the same problem always occurs. We have temperature reduction up, down, and it follows a consistent cycle as well. The thing is, as well, notice the, um, this isn't anything to do with carbon dioxide levels from human interaction, by the way. So obviously I know that there's the climate debate, obviously people take a side, but I can firmly say that these people didn't have cars. Right, so it's an, it, the interaction with the world isn't causing this. This is a natural cycle. It's actually called something called the Milankovitch cycles. Every 10,000 years, the Earth has a slight wobble. Every 20,000 years, there's a tilt. And every 100,000 years, notice the gaps. We get massive temperature reduction because the orbit's got elliptical. So these are things beyond our control, but the early humans who came to Europe would have not known this cycle. So obviously today we, we know there's ice ages, we can put in advance or think, oh, best not to do, they wouldn't have known. So Europe is one of the harshest classrooms in the known universe. So this then leads us to who actually came here. These people are called the, there's a cultural complex, the Aurignacian culture, 43,000 to 26,000. Obviously this culture, because it's the oldest one, it is still in existence even when other cultural packages come. It's only until there's been a complete cultural swap that these people disappear. Early attempts by these people were made coming to Europe, as I mentioned earlier on, the arrowheads. The earliest evidence in Europe of arrow use, meaning we had to have left Africa with these cultural packages. Because there's a debate, did we develop this when we came to Europe, you know, working alongside the wolf and the bow and arrow? No, we already left with this technology. The fact that the dingo is a dog that's a wolf that's lost the domestication qualities to it. The wolf has become feral, it's become a dingo again. The Aborigines aren't really an for using bows and arrows. You don't really need them when you're hunting flightless birds and things like that. So we know that in 57,000 BC there was an attempt in Europe, however there was no genetic information left uh, because the people just died. In. So even though early, early ancestors were successful in some cases, that was a, a failed attempt. Now, in 43,000 BC though we have the first people who actually not only colonise the place, but actually leave genetic information. Uh, so therefore, those that maintain population replacement levels left the Venus statues and other items of interest we find. So we find from this origination culture, now, a bit of a caveat. In the past, because all the previous Paleolithic archaeology was mainly limited to Europe, we then assume that it could have only been started in Europe. But like I said earlier, no, it clearly must have had some precursor to it. Um, so obviously in the past, like when um, people were doing anthropology and stuff, they kind of had the view that, well, maybe it was all uniquely started here and then spread around. Even though cultural modernity, as we call it, kicks in at 50,000 BC, 
these people were some of the other adopters of it. Um, so we'll see, um, have I got examples I should have next? So we've got um, the Venus statue, which is one of the earliest known examples of figurative art. Now, there's two debates on this, how, how it is. Some anthropologists believe this is portable pornography. Right, which seems <laughs> maybe possible. Remember, this is one of the things about uh, prehistory and stuff. It's very subjective because we have no written information from these people. Nobody left us. By the way, guys, this is our version of OnlyFans. They, di they didn't do that. We have to infer a lot. I don't think it was put up pornography. I think what we're seeing here is the ideal version of what humans want. They want a woman who can birth children. If, so for example, in this time frame, even though all the artwork is very curvy and busty, this is an ideal that we're seeking. This is, um, I think this denotes pregnancy. I don't think this denotes that they fancied fat women or anything. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, there is an incentive to fatten these women up. This isn't reliable calorific intake. <coughs> Just because you're hunter gathering doesn't mean it's a guaranteed success. So yeah, likewise, you would have fattened women up in the cave. But I genuinely think these are probably the, ide uh, the, the, the ideal view of pregnancy. In a world where people are just above starvation level, you, you'd want a woman who's able to birth children, feed them, and things like that. You don't want a flat-chested, scrawny woman with no hips, you know. <laughs> So it's, I don't think it's portable pornography. I think this is the ideal that they're seeking of uh, pregnancy. Um, so back again, we also find, remember back I was saying we used to watch lions in Africa, but however, we could never be their companion. And they hunted at night. We're only daytime people. So what happens is, is we get this statue uh, appearing. He's called the Lion Man of Hol Hollenstein. Uh, it's one of the oldest examples of artistic expression um, regarding, uh, like I said, the uh, it, uh, mixing human and animal together. So as we see in this particular slide, next one, this fella here, now, problem, it's the lion man. There's actually no evidence that it's a man. That could be a woman, by the way. Because we do find in later cultural packages, the next one to come, to, as a plot spoiler, it's mainly women who are in the role of being the, how would you call it the organiser and the shaman. Whether or not this is a man or a woman or not, the reason that they adopt the lion as the emblem, because it's the only thing that can beat them. It's the only thing that instills fear in these people. So the wolf at this point is your companion. He's not a threat, he's a friend. The other animals, we can hunt them. We can, you know, we're the danger. Lions are still dangerous at this time. We're talking massive, like, you know, cave lions. This is, these are ice age lions. These are not to be trifled with. This is also seen in Africa today. Uh, there's certain tribal people who will go on lion hunts. Now, even though these animals are dangerous, cause damage to the, the world, uh, the livestock and other things, and the, uh, the, the hunting sites, they still respect this animal. Even though this animal is the most dangerous apex predator, it's still revered. You know, it's that love-hate relationship. So we think what's going on here is, these people are respecting the lion in the wrong way, even though he's a danger to a competitor. Uh, the next slide, this example, when I said earlier on about leaving, so the first example of this is in Europe. These might have been in other cultures and countries around the world at the same time, but it only seems to be in Europe that we actually find the archaeological evidence of this. This is a vulture bone, again, bird bones hollow, the birds can sing, let's try and replicate it. This is an early example of it. Again, this would have been used, like I said, to uh, warn other humans and leverage our capabilities. Now, one of the things that the Aurignacian culture did. So if I were an Aurignacian, let's say I wanted dresses once, I'd have my lion hat on, I'd have my spear, but I'd also have a wolf pendant on. Uh, at this time frame, wolf teeth seem to be very, very sought after. Again, indication of companionship. M maybe the more wolf teeth you had proved that you were more cooperative. Maybe each one of these denoted a hook. We don't know. No, one never left us information. But if I'm going off the obsidian bead model, is this an indication of more trustworthiness, the more wolf teeth you have? Perhaps. But what we see is they wear the lion hat, but yet they revere their companion around the neck. But what makes the toolkit unique? So obviously, monkeys and crows can use tools, but we can make multifunctional ones. So the Neanderthal culture, they're renowned for, there's not much change between them and Homo erectus, really. They're still very primitive. They like, like hand axes and very, there's no, it's got no precision to it. Yet what happens is we develop very, very precise uh, flint napping techniques. Flint is used predominantly in this time, in Europe especially, as arrowheads. They're that small. Uh, one, of the, so one of the issues is, uh, 
we've got frontage ferrule heads and wood is in very short supply. Remember an example the world they're coming to. Even though this is southern France, this isn't France of today. The average mean temperature is 5 degrees. This is more like tundra. So one of the problems this early culture has is wood supply being in short supply. Therefore wastage is a major issue. How do we make sure, because the wood would have had to have been prioritised. Wood for burning in the cave, wood for at least using for the spears and arrows, but we have to be very careful with it. So what happens is, is we have a unique solution in Europe, and it is the reindeer antler of all things. Naturally shed, we don't have to hunt for the reindeer antler, it can just be left in the tundra. One of the things they noticed is, it's a way, it's a right, right, right hands to be turned into the most effective weapon. It doesn't shatter in the cold. Reindeer bone flexes. So flint, if I've got a spear, uh, they would have tied the flint to the spear, it shatters in the cold. Reindeer bone flexes. It's the ultimate weapon. Doesn't shatter in the cold, flexes under stress and can be replaced on a sharpened point. Do I have a slide of it? Let me have a quick look. No, might be a bit later on anything. So what they did is, um, if I'm making a spear today, I get a shaft of wood, drill a notch in it, and then you put your spearhead in and then tie it on with some twine, maybe a bit of tar or something like that. These people did it differently. They had a spear with a pointed edge, and then what they'd do is, with reindeer antler, because it, it has a certain, you can put the reindeer bone that's been shaped into a point on the top of this spear. One of the things about this is, and again, the anthropologist, they found these items, recreated them. When they're used in ballistics gel studies, they become a terrifying weapon. If I shoot you with a, or stab you with a spear, so imagine in the Iron Age, or Bronze Age, spear wielders, stab you with a spear, you pull it out. While the spear's in, you're not bleeding to death, unless it's something serious. The chances are it's, um, it's staunching its own wound. When these people stab the reindeer out of the bone into the animal and withdrew the spear, the reindeer out was still in. And what it does is it, um, it widens the thing, so you get immediate blood loss. They've done studies in this and they think even a, a mammoth or a megafauna beast could have been took down really quickly with this. So compared to other, like I say, if you stab something, like if the spear sticks in it, I've lost my wood, and also it's not bleeding to death. You pull your spear out and it's wedged with this thing and it causes major arterial bleeding. Yeah, once the tip is stuck into the target, it acts as a wedge, opening the wound, increasing blood loss compared to the sharpened spears of flint. So, here we go. So that gives you an idea of the cultural package, or the correction, the unique tool use. Uh, these are some of the classic pictures from France, uh, caves from southern France. We do notice, though, uh, as a stylistic thing, so obviously like, you're the art expert, uh, Pauline, you, you know about this, like every time period has its own artistic style or expression. One thing we notice about this time period, there's not many cases of humans being recorded. There is the odd one, I'll show you, but majority of times it's animal scenes. What we notice as well in these scenes, they tend to, uh, how do you call it now, there's a duality to it, so, and there's a, a logic to it. So in this scene, it's a predator scene. As you can see here, we see like cave lions, and these are, this is uh, predators all in one scene. In another picture, it would have been, maybe I've got that name, herbivores. Yeah, so this is an example. So in this one, uh, we've got horses. They, they, in each of these scenes, it's interesting, you see them drawing it regarding the environment. So you'll see horses mingling with other animals. Notice we've got rhinoceros and, the, and the horses are there. You'll see pictures of auroch and um, other horned animals fighting. And you'll see, like, um, it seems to be in the cave art, they're actually showing the animals in the proper environments. And they seem to do know the difference between predator and prey and their relationship to it. It is now, when I said there's not many pictures of humans in this time period, this is one of the very, very few. It's called the killed man. No, it's the small penis. <laughs> uh, he's a member of what we'd call bird clan. Notice he's got a beak. It's more like a duck, but it's a mask. And this thing here, uh, one of the only times it's ever seen it, pale yellow, up a pale yellow cat. So what's going on here then, audience? Uh, we've got a massive auroch. These are testicles. These are his intestines spilled out. And he's got a giant spear through him. He's laying on the floor in front of it, dead with his spear there. Now, again, they never left us any written information, so I have to sort of extrapolate what I'm seeing. Is this a case of don't screw up and get killed like him by standing in front of the, the auroch? Or is it a case this is an early example of self-sacrifice? Think about it from this point of view. Has he not, because he's only got a tiny spear and this is a massive one, 
So it's got a little bean. Is it not that this guy is willing to take the, how would you call it now? Like bullfighting. You need a guy to go, come on, come on. is this the guy who did that? Is this the guy that distracted everyone so they could stick a spear in the back of the old rock? Is this an early example of him willing to pay the ultimate price so everyone back at home can be fed? Because remember, it's the concept of self-sacrifice, like where does it begin? I think it could be this. This could be an early example of this issue. They clearly they revered him enough that they left that stuck in the ground as well. They clearly have taught him. So let's say, for instance, I'm a member of Wolf Clan. You'd probably live like a wolf head on a stick. But he must have been Bird Clan, mask, and that denote it. Um, let's look at the next slide. Ah, now this is something that is uniquely human, and I love this. Hand painting. What, what's going on here? So, to make these images, you can either stick your hand in ochre, which is hematite. Later on, this is used for iron. But the people at the time didn't know what they were messing about with is actually iron. They use red ochre, mixed up the water, and you can either do a handprint on a wall, or you can do something even cooler than it. Uh, that's probably an example of oh, this one. That's a good example of it. And that one. Where it's still the burr rock underneath. What they do is they get a straw, suck up a bit of the ochre, blow it against your hand. Now, this is something that other animals do. Like I said earlier on, we make fire, art, and things like that. This is very uniquely human. Only humans were able to self realize like the, the fact that we've put a handprint on that's something that's common the hand is a common aspect to all humans no matter what your skin color or where you're from we've all got a hand and it looks the same any human who would have come to this cave would immediately recognize this is where we live this is our place is this an early form of demarking ownership is this where every generation of people would put their hand on the wall and say this is mine this is where i live other people say is this like uh, only used for shamans there's some evidence of this, for instance, like we see some handprints, not necessarily in this one, but there's other pictures, where there'll be a missing finger. Uh, there'll be, now, <laughs> very subjective. Are them fingers missing because they've lost them in a hunt? Or are these fingers they've lost because they've cut them off themselves? We don't know, but um, in other cultures they do that. Uh, they'll self-mutilate. So just, to, just to denote that they're different, in a sense. So everyone puts their hand on the wall, but if the one finger's missing, maybe he's the shower with it. Now, so these people, they survived the previous culture, or Ignatian, that I would describe them. They survived from 40,000 BC to 26,000. What happens is, though, there is a major, major technological change going on. So because over this several thousand year period, we're getting more people being built up, we're getting longer life expectancy, we're getting further knowledge passed on. We then take this to another level. The apex in hunting strategies seen nowhere else in the world at this time is uh, seen in Europe and it's called the Gravettian culture. Gravettian settlers tended towards valleys that pulled migrating animals. So previous culture, they'd hunt the animals, but the geography wasn't the main factor. These Gravettians figured out these ice sheets, the they're, they're coming forward at a very slow pace, but they noticed the animals seemed to be uh, retreating from the ice or seasonal migration. These Gravettians were clever. Rather than run around catching the animals, let them come to you. They'd funnel them through valleys. An example of this is uh, the Greater Legala uh, Southern Italy site. Strategic settlement based on a small valley. As settlers became more aware of the migration patterns of the animals, like red deer, they learned that prey herded into them, thereby allowing the hunters to avoid travelling long distances for food. Uh, the glacial topography forced deer to pass through the area occupied by humans. So what we're doing is, is now, instead of, like say, chasing the animals, not randomly, but now we're actually using our environment to uh, help us. The Rivetians have thought to be innovative in the development of tools such as blunt back knives, tanged arrowheads and boomerangs. So the, back to what we were saying about the Aborigines, everyone thinks uh, the boomerang is a uniquely Australasian item. No, th this was used in Europe uh, 33,000 BC. Now one thing that they also did, these Rivetians, and it's almost like the beginning of modernity in, in some way, they make things like oil lamps. So imagine being in an, an, an Orignation cave, you're only relying on the fire pit. These people are putting little uh, lamps, maybe with whale oil, and, well, fish oil, things like that, maybe, something flammable. Um, and they also have a unique thing, that, well, not unique, the rope was already developed in the Aurignacian culture, but these people decided to make nets with them. Not only can you use nets for fishing, you can use them for hunting. So like I said, they're funneling animals through a narrow valley. All they have to do is just put a net up. So what you get is, is the bigger animals, you still have to take down with spears and do the hunter-gatherer strategy. Some of the smaller ones, like foxes and hers, they just get stuck in the nets. So you're getting more reliable food source. Instead of thinking, well, we've lost the mammoth today, screw it. You're thinking, well, I 
can fall back on this and catch a fox or like a her in the net. Uh, despite the cooling climate, the population was doubling. Uh, an example in the Oreg Nation culture, there's debate how many people it could be. We're only talking maybe a couple of thousand people across the whole of Europe. The chances of meeting anyone 40,000 BC would have been remote. You'd have been, wow, we've met another human. Wow, I didn't, didn't know there were else in Europe. That was the idea. But the population seemed to double at this time. Um, we also find, which, let's see if I've got it in the next slide, in this culture, so in, I'll explain something. So what makes this culture a bit different as well is they bury their dead. Not all of them, but some very important members of the society. The previous culture did something different. And it seemed to be in Tibet with the Oryg nations. With yeah. Speed it up a bit. Yeah, so the, um, in Tibet, for instance, we see something called excavation. It's where you throw a body off a cliff, smash all the bones and marrow on the rocks below, and then the birds eat you, the eagles specifically. One of the reasons we think that early man would have done the same thing is because we find very, very few Oryg nation. We only find bones like fragments. We don't see whole, very rarely do we find whole humans and like buried. It's, we think what they've done is they've just thrown the bodies out onto the plane. We think that they would have been eaten by the, uh, maybe the wolf, the lion, maybe the birds. And this would have been the, uh, the worldview. You know, I'm born, I, I'm in, in nature, and I'm going to go back to it. A, a, a phrase, for instance, that we see in you, you know, the concept of blood and soil. I'm going to say it's blood and feather. So, for example, what would have happened in excavation cultures in, in revered birds, you throw, you've used the bird's body to eat, you've used its uh, bones to play musical instruments, you're using its feathers for flight feathers. What's the ultimate reward? You go back to them. So in other words, that every time this culture has excavated the dead, the next generation of birds, in theory, have got a bit of your ancestry in as well. That could be an idea. So, population is doubling, uh, but the world is changing around them. So here we go, this is the example of... Oh, there's no picture on that. Oh, the, the, yes. That's an example of the woman I'm going to be talking about now. Um, the Lady of Cad How would we pronounce this name? Cadiglone. Uh, the single burial discovered in the cave held a woman, and a, which is possibly a shaman. How do we know this? She seems to be wearing headgear and deer teeth. The body was covered with red ochre, buried on her left side, faced in west, with her hands close to her face and legs folded. There's clearly a great... She wasn't just left for the animals, she was um, revered. She was encased in an external coating of red hematite armour that prevents soft tissues from rotting away. This is like another form of preservation of the body. She must have been very important if you go to this length at this time to do this. She had to have been buried in a place as a memorial. Burial as a predetermined de depth formed a bed in the sandy clay soil that prevented predators from attacking her. So one of the logics as well is like, why do we bury our dead? We don't, it's just a practicality. We don't want like wolves coming into the cave looking for bodies and things. Um, she had to continue to be a fountainhead of her, uh, their energies uh, despite her death. So she was still playing a role in their society despite death. The ceremony was performed after the, bo the body ornaments had been placed in position. The death of was a great challenge to face. So, so this woman, uh, for instance, we find she's one example. There's another one, a woman who's 40 year old when they find her. That's old in caveman times. She had the body of a 70 year old in our modern world. Maybe an older woman than that. Uh, she can barely walk. She'd have had to have been took from place to place. She couldn't have just been left until she died on her own. We think one of the reasons they revere is because of the knowledge. 40 year old in that time, you know a lot. And what we think is going on is, and it's seen, there's, there's also a progression in Venus statues as well. So clearly, like the, the re revering of the woman takes on an uh, even bigger form. We think these women would have been very instrumental. We think. Uh, they would have stayed behind in the cave and taught the children and done low, oh, it says in the next slide, where is it now? High risk, high reward. So this is something the Gravettians did. We notice prior to this, humans seem to be sexual uh, similar in height, size and everything. The Gravettians, we see what we'd see in the modern world, how men seem to be bigger than women. Men also have 50% upper body strength uh, compared to a woman. What happens is, is here we see it seems to be based on high risk, High reward, low risk, low reward. So men go out hunting mammoths, women stay at home in the cave, dealing with smaller things. This then results in the men having to go out into the ice sheets being six foot two on average when they've found bones of these people. That's huge, even by today's standard, six foot two. I mean, you're pretty big at the back, aren't you? You're in this category, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, now, the women, though, so we're talking six foot two, that's tall even for today. Women, though, on average, was something um, a lot smaller than this. They seem to be in the range of five foot two. So we're talking a full height difference, and one foot in height difference. 
Um, this immediately just implies we've completely task specialised. Men are clearly doing a different activity to the women and it's showing in the genetic code whereby we're getting bigger men, shorter women. Examinations of brevetting in schools reveal also high cheekbones. So, <laughs> like I said, the previous picture of a woman, that's what uh, brevetting women would look like. So, unfortunately though, all good things have to come to an end. So even though this is a massive development from the Oreg Nation culture, the Gravettians, though, unfortunately, go the way of the world. Now, it's, tr it's interesting because the Gravettian culture is the last time we see in Europe proving this strategy had to work and it must have been the best one. Because everyone else, in, everyone in Europe is a Gravettian at this time. We notice that every person in that, every human group in that time has not only the same tool, package and cultural use, there's also a genetic component to it. So the Cro-Magnon, uh, it's called the Goyette Cluster. Uh, these people, the Gravettians, it's called the Visconti uh, Cluster, I believe. And it does show, even though there's the cultural packages moving across Europe, there's also a genetic component to this. Because it's more successful, the men can breed. All good things must come to an end. In 22,000 BC, this is the worst point test. This is our second one. The Gravettian culture that was spread, I mean, it would go all the way, remember where the ice was previously up to there. What's happened is, is the ice has completely uh, advanced on southern Europe. What we get is, unfortunately, the culture breaks into two. Human, uh, human culture, the European culture at this time is never uh, unified again. Even today, there's different kinds of European culture. This is the, the first break. This is what we'd say like the, the modern European experience beginning. So what happens is, is we get a split in mode of life. Let's say at the lowest ebb. The glacial maxima is approaching, forcing humans into racial refuges. The Gravettian archaeology are the last human uh, European culture considered unified. Two distinct cultures emerge. Uh, in response to the cold, we have the, these people in the previous slide. So this is called Epigravettians. So these are still Gravettians, but uh, they're still mammoth hunters. Um, one of the things that, like I said, they, they make houses, uh, what's it, campsites with mammoth bones, rather than like living caves and stuff, open earth sites. So what happens is, is uh, two distinct cultures emerge. We have the Epigravettians, we also have something called the Sultrian. Culture. So, them are the people who were in France, if you look at the previous slide. The Sultrian culture having the most advanced toolkit yet seen and yet to be seen throughout the Upper Paleolithic. So, even though this is like the midpoint, this is the technological apex when it comes to making uh, arrowheads and various other tools. They think what they would have done is, is um, probably use javelins and things. That's something that the archaeologists are debating what's going on. The method permitted the working of delicate slivers of flint into tiny projectiles in elaborate barbed and tanned arrowheads. So now we've got like really advanced technology coming. Large thin spearheads, scrapers with edge knots on one side but on the end, flint knives and even saws. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're in up, we're in up, we're in up. Yeah. Um, bone rattle was used as well. So what happens is, is the cycle now has to begin anew. So we've got the sultry culture down here. So this is a bit of curiosity. So even though this culture is more technological advanced and obviously spreads, and becomes what we're known as the Magdalenian cultures. The Epirugavetians, if you remember from the previous map, take up more space. What happens is, is there's almost like a, a migration occurring in Europe. Because this is the more cultural successful package, and the animals now, so imagine living in Italy, most of the megafauna's gone now. You've probably hunted most things to extinction level. You have to go northward. You have to keep pursuing the megafauna like the Arab nations did. So what happens is, even though this is a smaller genetic group than what's that much more advanced, People leave and join this culture. And what we find is, is this is where we get the original beginnings of the DNA for what's called the Western hunter-gatherer. At this point, it's a combination of sultry and DNA mixed in with a big bit of epigravetium. And this becomes the baseline of what's known as the Western hunter-gatherer. So the Magdalene's though are the first indication of this as a culture. It's also the last days of the megafauna this time. Mm -hmm. The mammoth's on his way out. This is now obviously the mammoth does survive in islands off Siberia, but that's the anomaly. It's because like the ice has melted and they're stuck on islands. Up till this point, Europe's been the last of the mammoth being cleaned out. The wrapping. So what happens is, is the ice has gone really far, broke our culture into two, then the ice rapidly retreats again, and it's left a new world to discover. The rapid period of warming reshapes Europe's land and shoreline. Uh, one of the things we noticed in the Gravettian culture, a lot of their sites were near the coastline as well. That's now underwater. They found a cave in France, it's called the Cave of the Mermaids, and the entrance is underwater. They only found it by diving. Uh, some people, uh, explorers, were diving around and thought, oh, what's this, this hole in this one? 
swam into this cave, it went up, goes up and up, and then they're in a gallery full of artwork. And they were saying, oh, so this must have been a coastal site that you accessed, and they went up into the hill, but the entrance were lost for thousands of years, until the modern age. Um, so we see Europe's geography changing dramatically. We see that coastlines are all getting flooded out, and the people having to go catching the megafauna northwards. The, contrast, uh, the constant need for new things me means pursuing the last of the mammoths to extinction. Entire populations and industries dependent on the mammoths have now gone. This is one of them things where it's, uh, it's, it's good to be in innovative in this time. Entire cultures, family groups would have had no access to the raw materials. They are now useless in the society. So you either regress and die or you go and join the, what would be called the Magdalene culture. Um, yeah, the need to cooperate, had to migrate and cooperate with populations of the Sultry and Culture Complex in order to survive. The Magdalene genetics of Western, uh, a mix of Epigretin and Sultry. The age of the reindeer hunter has now begun. So before I'm, we obviously hunted reindeer, but the mammoths are all gone. This is our primary focus now. There's nothing else but reindeer to get. Now the issue is, is though, what happens to those who stayed? This is what we'd call the mini dark age, or like the um, Paleolithic dark age. As, we're, as the, the more productive, the more ambitious, those who, who realise that unless we leave we're going to die, those that stayed behind really began regressing. Uh, these people stay here until, um, like I said, the, the farming peaks. So we've got a complete reduction in culture. Uh, the effects of the melting ice sheets would diminish the food supply and probably impoverished the previously well-fed cultures, or at least those who had not followed the herds northwards. As a result, a zillion tools, it's a, a zillionisation, it appears all the way from Spain, all the way through Europe, in Romania, there's in Elvis, this where you've got advanced previous hunter-gatherer cultures that have just gone down a, a notch. A zillion remains are few and uh, a lot fewer and rather simpler, indicative of a, of a group of people going through population decline. So anybody who's an hunter-gatherer who stayed in southern Europe, it's over. That culture's coming to an end. Those who pursue the reindeer north, they then become the basis of what we are today, the Western home together. So, in conclusion, this is one of the issues. So, we've, uh, by 10,000 BC, our modern Euro European climate and environment has more or less stabilised. Our last time of the ice is called the Younger Dryas. After that, Europe, as we see it today, and the animal analogues are all there. Instead of having to hunt in the ice sheets and mammoths, we've now hunting's become a little bit easier, not as dangerous in this time. Now, one of the issues here was this is the time frame I'm talking about. We're talking 60,000 years. In conclusion, this cultural package has stood the test of time. Unfortunately, we've only been around as a modern cultural package for 6,000 years since the invention of agriculture. Well, correction, the, the whole scale adoption of it. We've not survived 60,000 years. We don't really have the ability to like, look on the past and judge it in the same way. We, we have to notice that the past has clearly passed the test of time. We've yet to prove it. And what it also implies is, as other human groups in the world today are still doing this cultural package, it's clearly the fallback mechanism. This is how we survive. If all else fails, we can go back to the original strategy and start the cycle anew. So that's the idea. So if all else fails, we can also we can come back to being a hunter gatherer again. So I'm hoping in all this, I mean obviously that's the conclusion in it all, but yeah, that's the final slide. Yeah, so I hope that makes sense, audience, that our ancestors had to cooperate on a fundamental basis more than the other hominids around them, and we let nature teach us. And in that process, we became the most successful group, and likewise have stood the test of time. And I believe Europeans have earned their place to be here by blood, sweat and tears and death. Let's say our continent is, uh, and again, it's not like uh, all modern Europeans are all hunter gatherers. We, we can take a fraction of the DNA, but it's still here, it's still in us. And I'm hoping, like I said, if all else fails, we can go back to that strategy, as other cultures on planet Earth have clearly shown. So in that audience, I hope I've, you've learned something there about all the, these primitive cultures, and uh, if all else fails, let's go on the hunt again. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, everyone, from my part as well. I'm Patrick O'Rourke, and uh, it's very humbling to be introduced to the next expert on the Finnish pagan, and uh, I would say I'm merely a practicer of the religion. Uh, but today I will be talking also and mainly as a linguist, uh, that is my academic career. And so this uh, talk on the origin of the Finns and their traditional religion will be 
very much influenced by historical linguistics. And the reasons will be in the following slide. And also, I'm very happy to be talking about this uh, topic today, since today is the Kindred People's Day, which we celebrate in Finland, Estonia, and Hungary to commemorate our Finno-Greek identity. So, to the topic. So, firstly, a few words about ethnogenesis itself. Uh, as Richard's talk was on the prehistory, uh, which we have no direct access to, uh, ethnogenesis is uh, related to nations uh, that exist now and we can trace the lineage in some way or another. Uh, the formation here refers to the passive uh, process and pro uh, passive mechanism of ethnogenesis. Development uh, refers to the active part. It's not a clear uh, difference in all cases. Um, of the ethnic group, because if we think of uh, speakers of two closely related languages or two dialects of the same language, they tend to uh, emphasize the region of their local and regional identity by uh, using different words uh, which they understand to be of this other language or, the, or use uh, different uh, phonological features. In those people in that other village say uh, math in Finnish, for example, and the other ones say mia, and then we know that they speak like that and we speak like this. So this is uh, what we'd say is an unconscious uh, development of an ethnic group to create uh, an identity. Uh, the development, the active part, will be discussed in the talk about the modern art of Finland. So. This would be about the, the prehistory. And prehistory uh, is, uh, and ethnogenesis uh, in general, uh, is also something that can be studied. There's no specific uh, field of ethnogenetics as a study itself, but uh, it's more of an interdisciplinary approach which combines historical linguistics, archaeology, uh, genetics uh, of current populations and past populations and also ethnology and folkloristics. I'll also be mentioning uh, some mythology in the end. And uh, the Finnish linguist Peter Kallio has, uh, in his, one of his articles, one of his many articles, uh, said that uh, a historical linguist confronts a question from a layman, usually. Uh, so when, when, when did Finns come to Finland? So that's um, one of the starting points of this talk as well. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, first of all, how linguistics uh, as a field uh, studies the past. So there are three uh, main fields or approaches of studying linguistic history. One is internal reconstruction, so uh, we have the paradigm of a word, for example, in language, and we try to trace the origins of these forms. So here we have the word for one in Finnish. Uh, in nominative, in genitive, and the essive. Uh, what we see in common with all these is, for example, the first vowel, u. It is a two-syllable word, uk, si. And here we see that n, the genitive marker, closes the syllable. So we have two closed syllables. And why this is important is that we see u, de, na, as a three syllable word where this de syllable, the second syllable, is open. So here we see a feature known as consonant gradation in Finnish. And so we can trace, okay, so d and t go back to a single dental. Uh, single dental form. But then we have this, from a synchronic point of view, an anomaly. Why is there a C and not a D? Well, that is why we have comparative, uh, historical comparative linguistics and the method itself to have a look at other languages of uh, the related, other related languages to see 
what could be the original one. So here we have Sani Octa, uh, Octa and Marikte. And so we see, okay, C as a syllable was previously something like a D. And this is also something that is confirmed from the third uh, approach of historical linguistics, that is loanwords. So I'll show a slide of uh, different loanwords in Finnish at some point of this presentation. So, in other words, combining these three approaches, we get a proto-Uralic uh, form, a paradigm, and then linguistics works to explain what happened in between. And the current uh, history of Finnish, uh, as we now know, is that Finnish is a language of the Proto-Finnic branch. Uh, Proto-Finnic uh, is a reconstructed language, there is no historical attestation of the language, uh, but using historical linguistics we see that Finnish, Estonian, Livonian, Karelian, Beps, Botic, Ingrian, and South Estonian, of course, are uh, descended from the same language. This is uh, now a branch, ancestral branch, that is, so to say, directly from Proto Uralic, which is the reconstructed language of all the known Uralic languages. This is uh, something that has um, been something that is a paradigmatic change in uh, phenolinguistics, the linguistic uh, branch of studying Uralic languages. We talk about nine elementary branches now, which is the red model. Traditional linguistics has uh, divided languages in, according to a binary division. Uh, also in uh, phenolic languages, now it is called Uralic languages. Uh, I'll show in the next slide all the nine elementary branches, but so now we talk about all these branches separating uh, more or less at the same time. And this language uh, is uh, Proto-Uralic, it's spoken, it was spoken in Western Siberia. Uh, according to the latest uh, research, previously there has been talk about it being on the European side, but I'll, I'll show you in the next slide. And so yes, this presentation more or less starts from the year 2500 BC. Now, here is a, a map by uh, Rico Grintal and others uh, from 2020, in which they talk about uh, drastic demographic changes occur occurring in North Eurasia, which led to the spread of proto uralic And when I uh, mentioned the nine elementary branches. Uh, here we have the homelands uh, uh, mapped from west to east. We have Finnic, Sami, Mordvin, Mari, Permic, Hungarian, Mansi, Hanti, and Samiedic. These languages uh, are connected uh, through loanword studies and and uh, combining linguistic results with archaeology to the early Bronze Age. Uh, however, the reconstructed uh, proto uralic lexicon, which is between two and five hundred words, depending on how uh, rigid the criteria are, uh, they point to the proto uralic people being uh, Neolithic hunter-gatherers. Uh, in European uh, studies of prehistory, we know the term Neolithic package, which means the migration of people, introduction of agriculture and pottery. This does not apply uh, in, in Eurasia, northern Eurasia. Uh, pottery was spread from east to west uh, without agriculture, and also, as far as we know at the moment, without any migration any significant migration and most likely uh, it spread along the same path as uh, Uralic languages. Here are the southern routes marked which are waterways 
these are the Irtish uh, River here and uh, the Volga River, uh, Gamma River here, Volga River here. And then there's a northern route as well along the Ob and the northern Vina and Vichegda rivers. This is uh, an ancient uh, waterway uh, trade route, uh, as I said, related to the spread of pottery. Uh, but this is also uh, related to the spread of uh, Seima Turbino as a cultural phenomenon. Seima Turbino refers to uh, bronze objects, uh, axe heads, and other, for example, small jewelry, jewelry etc. It's not uh, connected with any specific archaeological culture. However, there are these shared uh, characteristics within same, uh, found Seima Turbino sites, uh, the oldest being on the Siberian side and spreading, as we can see, more or less according to the waterways. So it was a uh, trade network uh, spread along the previous known routes. And chronologically, uh, the Seima Turbino phenomenon is connected with a, uh, uh, with the 4.2 Ka event, meaning the cooling of uh, uh, the climate in the north, more rainfall here in the, the west, and the drying of the Caspian and Kazakh steppes. And this was a, a, a drastic event for the demographics of the Indo-European peoples. So there had to be migration away from the steppes, which uh, have been found to have been overgrazed even before this uh, uh, crisis. So when the climate cooled and got more dry, arid, uh, there was already a strain on the environment. So once this uh, climate change happened, uh, it led to a cultural change as well. It led to significant militarization. It uh, led to fortified settlements uh, for in the Sintashta cultural area, for example, and so there was a, an increased need of uh, bronze, uh, bronze uh, weapons. Um, and who, uh, and what was the social linguistic context of this? Uh, because we have uh, copper mines here. Arsenic copper was used around the Ural Mountains, uh, but tin was acquired from the Altai and Sain Mountains. So again, we have a we see that uh, they are the other uh, opposite ends of the trade route, a waterway. So the tin was traded to create bronze, which then was a successful tool, a uh, successful material for trade. Who were these people uh, who were involved in the bronze trade? Uh, 2500 BC, as a date, is very late uh, if we consider the Indo-European neighbours to the south. Uh, this being Taiga, so a zone of uh, coniferous trees and uh, the steppe people and the wooded steppe in the south. So the Fatyanovo uh, culture and the following Abasheva culture and then the Balanova culture, Balanova culture have been uh, connected to the uh, eastern corridor where horizon. So, at least the Fatyanovo people uh, could have been either Proto-Baltic, uh, Baltoslavic, or Para-Baltic, Baltoslavic, uh, or some Kento language that hasn't survived to our days. Whereas the Boltavka and Sintashta cultures were Indo-Iranian or Proto-Indo-Iranian. And so, the third event which we can date with more or less absolute chronology is the, the influence of Indo-Iranian on Proto-Uralic. So the Poltavka and Sintashta cultures are more or less uh, around 2800 to 2200 before Christ. And uh, there are Indo-Iranian loanwords in eight of the nine branches uh, which uh, went through their own 
dialectal developments, the linguistic developments. So we can say that they were not borrowed as words into Proto-Uralic itself, but rather Proto-Uralic spread rapidly and then uh, these rapidly spread different dialects diverged individually and separately. And so we have an idea that maybe the Indo-Iranians were the commissioners of the uh, bronze traders to settle colonies along this, uh, this waterway. And I mentioned uh, eight out of nine branches and uh, the reason is that Samoyedic as a branch does not really have any Indo-Iranian loanwords to speak of. This is now connected with the idea of the binary branching that I mentioned in the previous slide, that uh, the traditional idea was that Proto-Uralic first diverged into Samoyedic and Finno-Greek. This is based on uh, the shared lexicon. Uh, Samoyedic as a branch has uh, a significant layer of uh, a significant amount of lexicon which is not connected with any of the other Uralic branches. So here we can see, based purely on linguistic reasons, that there was a substratum, there was a previous uh, population which then started speaking a, uh, a Uralic language, which then evolved into Samoyedic, which then spread northwards later, uh, when Samoyedic was a branch of its own. Uh, Whereas with the other branches along the waterways, we don't really have a significant substratum layer. Uh, so what can we deduce uh, from this? Uh, well, that Samoyedic was a separate dialect by the time this branch spread. Uh, however, uh, lexicon is not the best way to determine the, the divergence of branches in linguistics, more, it's more of a phonological reasons, sound, regular sound changes which help us uh, put the taxonomy in place better. And so there aren't that many phonological changes uh, shared by every, every other branch and Samoyedic. So again, this supports the modern uh, idea of a rake model uh, or it originally presented already by that <coughs> some, some time ago. So, that would be the, uh, the linguistic and archaeological explanation of how did proto uralic spread to its, uh, uh, more or less to the, its current uh, ancestral, well, its ancestral homelands and its current location. Genetics as a branch of, I mean, as a, as a study of uh, ethnogenesis is uh, very recent compared to linguistics and even archaeology. And I won't, uh, I'm not uh, capable of speaking about genetics and linguists, so I will be just referring to uh, what the geneticists have been uh, studying recently. This is uh, from Christina Tambet's at Alia from 2018. So there have been a few uh, studies from 2018. Uh, one was Dambets et al. Uh, and then the other one was uh, Lamnidis et al. And Dambets et al. point out that there is, when we cluster the genetic heritage into nine clusters, there is a uh, Siberian element uh, present in populations. Uh, in a lot of uh, the Uralic populations we see Sami, uh, we see Mari, Udmurt and Komi, so Udmurt and Komi are the Permic languages, Mari here is the Volcaic language, uh, Mansi and Hanti, and then uh, Nenets, Nanasans and Selkups. So Nenets here, Nanasan here, and Selkups here. But of course we see that the same component is present in Ketz and Shores who live on the middle, in the say, and also amongst the North Russians. There, however, we have a case of language shift 
from uh, a Uralic language to a Slavic language. And uh, Lanidis et al. Uh, point out that we don't know much about the genetic history of Northeastern Europe. Uh, what I said about I mean, the, the date I gave, 2500 BC, of course, is after the three main migrations of this modern world of 6,000 years, uh, which shaped Europe as it currently is. So uh, there is uh, a lot in common with the, uh, the Finns and the Estonians, for example, with their neighbors. In fact, uh, the Uralic nations, wherever they are, they have more in common with their immediate ancestors, I mean, ancestors' neighbors, than they do have with uh, people speaking a related language group. But what this does show is uh, actually support for the rake model, in that uh, uh, in the Taiga zone, in the early Bronze Age, or the yeah, early Bronze Age, uh, there was a rapid spread of a small population, uh, and this also uh, these these languages uh, expanded through language shift. So, social linguistically, uh, we have uh, a prestigious language, which was preferred by the population over the uh, previous language. And that's about uh, Proto-Uralic. Then we come closer in time to um, towards towards Finnic, not Finnic at this point yet. This is a uh, map by the Estonian archaeologist Walter Lang, who has been uh, uh, studying the archaeology of the Finnic peoples and. He has uh, produced archaeological, presented archaeological results which uh, support this new chronology of Uralic languages uh, from 2500 BC onwards. Just to mention briefly in this, uh, uh, the, 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 the revolutionary uh, influence and effect of Olang's work is that previously there has been uh, the scientific consensus that uh, the Uralic languages were spoken uh, in Finland ever since the earliest uh, inhabitants of this region due to there being a continuity of archaeological culture. So there has been no discontinuity at any point. Therefore, we conclude that the Finns have lived here forever. Mm. Linguistically, it does not, it's not true. I mean, linguistically, languages spread from a small place, small location, and expand, diverge, and so on. So uh, genetically, of course, it's, it's the case, but then again, there's been language shift, as we can see. Uh, and so, especially here, when we talk about the Finnic uh, ancestry, uh, here we have the Daugava River, currently uh, covered by the Arrow, and the Upper Dnieper. Here. So the idea presented by Lang is that the Uralic, the Western Uralic population who developed along the upper Volga and Oka rivers, which is nowadays we call is more or less the Valdai Plateau, this area, the textile ceramic uh, producing uh, population spread in two directions. The northern, I mean, northwestern passage, which traditionally has been connected with the Finnic language, is actually uh, a migration which can be connected with the ancestry of the Sami. Whereas the Finnic migration would be connected with a route from the upper Dnieper to the Daugava all the way to the, uh, the Baltic Sea. This happened uh, more or less uh, beginning from 1100 BC in multiple waves. So this uh, migration of several waves ended more or less around 800 BC 
And from that point onwards, we can start to talk about the early Protophinic. Uh, here is the core area of textile ceramic, uh, in the middle Volga, and the so-called uh, developed Klimentova textile ceramics around Moskva, uh, Moskva Moscow, and uh, Central Oka, and this will be the one which is connected with the uh, pre-Finnic population. Here we have the Ananino axe uh, type uh, area. The Ananino are a Bronze Age culture connected with the Permic uh, people, also having ancestry uh, uh, in the, the, the Mari having also Ananino ancestry. And this uh, line, or the uh, diagonal line this way is uh, the core area of the Akosino Malar axis. So if you, uh, I don't have a picture of that at the moment, but the Akosino Malar type axe is a concept uh, known in uh, Bronze Age uh, studies referring to a, a, a bronze axe type which is spread from central Sweden all the way to the middle Volga. Previously, it was uh, considered to have originated in Sweden, but we have uh, axes which are older than the ones in Sweden coming from the central Volga. So we can conclude that there was actually a migration east to west. And interestingly, we don't have any trace of this anymore, but this, this uh, migration uh, did not stop at the Baltic Sea's uh, eastern shores, but actually spread to southwest. Uh, Finland and all the way to central Sweden, so some lost Uralic tribe possibly uh, disappeared in prehistory there. And so these, uh, um, apart from the axes, there are uh, certain new uh, cultural traces uh, connected with this migration. Of course, textile ceramics, pottery, as a new type. Uh, but then also the uh, development of fortified settlements in the Baltics. So this was uh, during the late, late Bronze Age and most likely connected with this, uh, these uh, waves of Uralic migration. And so later we have these uh, uh, fortified settlements along the coast as well, and this uh, this marks here this uh, checked pattern marks the uh, Eastern Germanic population around the year 1000 BC, and uh, around 800 BC the uh, uh, contacts went up north and Finnic developed from early Proto-Finnic to middle Proto-Finnic. And I'll show you some known words and talk about that in a bit. But first I want to show another map by Walter Lang which now uh, shows the model of how late Proto-Finnic spread. Late Proto-Finnic nowadays is dated to around 200 AD to 800 AD. So connected with uh, Iron Age uh, migration patterns as well. So the current proposed homeland, which has re uh, been received well within uh, historical linguistics, within Finn linguistics, this uh, homeland is an uh, area which uh, is uh, north and northeastern Estonia. Traditionally, it's the area gave its uh, gave the name for the entire area of Estonia in Finnish. So, uh, could you repeat that? It's stuck. So, can you repeat? So, uh, the area um, where late Proto-Finnic spread from. Uh, corresponds to the uh, late Iron Age county of Viruma, uh, 
uh, which in Finnish would be Vironma, and the name of the county gave its name to the Finnish name of uh, Estonia. Viro is, uh, is a name which uh, comes from Germanic. So we have the English word for werewolf, the first part where is originally from the same root as Viro. So it's the land of men. So the men who uh, came and conquered the coasts. And that leads to the idea of uh, Finnic and Germanic contacts. Previously in uh, Finnogristics, when reconstructing the proto uralic language, uh, the idea was that Finnish is a conservative language and Finnic is a conservative branch. But that gave a very Finno-centric uh, reconstruction uh, of Uralic. And we now know that Finnic actually is a branch which has diverged very much phonologically from the rest of Uralic languages. Uh, large, largely due to intense uh, Indo-European contacts. So I showed you the model of different waves of migration. The textile ceramic area was bordering the descendants of the Fatinova culture, which spoke a proto-Baltic, para-Baltic language. Uh, in the Baltic area, this, this uh, language eventually, this language-speaking community was assimilated into the uh, Uralic-speaking community, which produced Finnic languages. And we have about two to three hundred loanwords from starting from this period. I mean, there are later, of course, uh, later Latvian loanwords in Estonian, South Estonian, and Livonian. But when we talk about the ancestral language of uh, Finnish, we have from all walks of life, all, all different fields. We have hunting and fishing, hirvi, elk, sampi, sturgeon. Uh, some primitive archaeology was practiced uh, in the Fatinova culture and its descendants. Uh, interesting, siemen as a seed is a, a, a Baltic loan word, but then hiema, which means little, or, uh, or sandy in some dialects, is a Germanic loan word. So, the interesting uh, correspondence with the SMS, but that's, yeah, that's going into etymology. Anyways, uh, you see the ram and shepherd being concepts which are uh, adopted from the Baltics. But then also we see uh, words for daughter, titar, sister, sisar, morsian, bride, uh, and even a concept as uh, tooth, hamas, from the Baltic language. Uh, when we talk about loan words, when, uh, when loan words are analyzed, usually they are explained as cultural loans. When there, there is a new concept, uh, the word signifying this new concept is borrowed uh, as well. So, proto uralic people being Neolithic hunter gatherers, there were no shepherds, so the first ones to teach them how to shepherd were the Balts. So, uh, hence the Baltic loanword. But then, Hamas, I mean, of course, the Uralic people had teeth before contact with the Baltic people, so this just shows how intense the contacts were, so we talk about mixed families for hundreds of years, being bilingual. And so, there, there we get these, this, uh, these semantic fields of long words. And now, having said this about the Baltic contacts, it's even larger with the Germanic ones. So, when the Finnic uh, language spread from the Baltic Sea, uh, the Eastern Baltic, all the way to southwest Finland and so on. Uh, the coastal area was uh, inhabited by uh, Germanic speaking people. Uh, not just uh, Germanic, but we talk about Paleo Germanic also. The first, first loan words were uh, from a language which later e developed into Proto Germanic. Uh, and the culture was slightly different from that of the Balts. Uh, more field agriculture and animal husbandry were practiced, uh, such as, I mean, not just slash and burn, which was uh, part of the terminology 
uh, Dr. von Bart, but field agriculture in that we have even the word for field, Elton, uh, from a Germanic source language, word for hoof, hoof, cavio. Uh, uh, this is a word which even is borrowed before the Proto Germanic uh, or the Paleo Germanic R became O. So uh, it's, it's a very old, old word. Uh, Nauta, the word for cattle, there is a dialectal word for neat in English. So there's a, uh, in, I mean, an example of a long word as well. Most of these uh, words here uh, I chose to rep show a, um, a Finnish and an English comparison. So you get the idea of uh, firstly what kind of vocabulary was borrowed and how Finnish as a language has preserved the uh, very archaic structure. Some words did not uh, stay on in English itself with the proto germanic word for liva, I mean for ship, it's liva, or flavia in uh, proto reconstructed proto-germanic sail, uh, so we see that the germanic people living on the coast of Port had a maritime culture and so our linguistic ancestors adopted this. But then we also have more indications of uh, very intense uh, societal contacts. The rich king, Rikas Kuningas. This, these two words actually are even very close to the reconstructed Proto-Germanic word, words. So Kuningas, Kuning in Old English. So uh, Finnish has preserved a lot of the archaic structure of the Germanic words which they also then help to reconstruct Germanic itself. And another example, the daughters were Balts but the mothers were uh, Germanic. So again an indication of what kind of contacts there were. And then when we come to Finland and Karelia, uh, the northwestern passage I showed as a migration route for the Sami. It uh, is also the reason why there is a Sami substrate, substrate layer in Finland and Karelia. It's not very much studied, uh, more work needs to be done on this, but uh, here in, in Espoo, uh, which is next to Helsinki, there is a nature park called Nuxio, very nice place, I recommend you all visiting if you have a chance. The name Nuxio uh, comes from a Sami word for swan, Nuxo. So that's to, sh to show how south the Sami uh, population was. And it's uh, also uh, apparent from a map. I, I really tried to look for a good map of uh, Iron Age uh, permanent settlement in uh, Finland in the Iron Age. Uh, this is, this is uh, what I could find. And this shows the light blue is the Merovingian age uh, permanent population, uh, permanent settlement in Finland. So from the sixth to the ninth century uh, A.D. And then both Merovingian and uh, Crusade age, which is known as uh, well, the Viking age uh, or the Crusade age. Um, referring to up until the 14th century and then the red is just the uh, crusade age uh, settlement so here we see the spread of Finnish as a language and culture in Finland so when I mentioned the pre I mean the earliest Finnic migration from the Baltic uh, area to Finland this is also the same area where there has been the um, longest uh, Finnic uh, population. Uh, here is a um, river called Eura Joki. Eura is a Proto-Germanic uh, word from Etra. And um, Gumi uh, river here is uh, Kwamia, reconstructed Germanic. So the Germanic population living in this coastal area was uh, assimilated by the Finnic, which led to Finnish, and then, well, before that it was North Finnic, which then spread from the coast along 
Kokemään joki to Hame, and then started settling along this uh, latitude all the way to Lake Ladoga. In the middle, scattered everywhere, were nomadic Sami hunter and gatherers. Hunters and gatherers. So uh, the population of Finland uh, has been, I mean, the, has developed out of a uh, centuries-long assimilation of Sami into the Finnish culture. So there are a lot of Sami substrate names, like I said, Nuxio, but then dialectal features. And this, there are records of Sami living inland all the, uh, up until the 16th century onwards. So uh, that's uh, something that's contributed to fin Finnish as a language and culture. Another one being the Old Karelian and the West Finnish eventually spreading northward, like the Samoyedic, which is a typical pro uh, North Eurasian pattern of migration going northwards. Uh, and here the Karelians have spread, and then the West Finns, and all these dialects in between, for example, Savo dialect is a merger of, of these two. So uh, we can talk about basically two. Uh, stems of the Finnish population. And these are the, the uh, let's say, the, the linguistic, archaeological, and genetic uh, overviews. And this isn't related, of course, <laughs> to uh, Finnish or Finnic, as, as I'm sure you know. This is from Ulus and Remus. But I talk about this now uh, from the point of view of mythology. Uh, and mythology is connected with ethnogenesis, uh, for example, in the idea of a founding myth. So there in even in the Roman founding myth of Romulus and Remus, there is a, a trace of an archaic uh, connection with the totemistic animal. The wolf as, a, as an ancestor uh, of a certain tribe is a concept which is not just among the Romans, but many Germanic tribes connected themselves to the wolves. The Turks uh, in Eurasia have connected themselves to the heavenly wolf. And, and we can see that the uh, uh, Eurasian step is, in, is let's say on a, on a macro level, it's more or less an area which is, so to say, the land of the wolf. So a lot of the tribes from this area uh, trace their ancestry to the wolf. Uh, in the Finnic Uralic concept, where the, the largest predator of the taiga area is not the wolf, but the bear. And uh, we can we can say that uh, we can suggest assume that a similar totemistic ancestral uh, spirit animal would have been the bear. We know this uh, from uh, at least the Sami in North Lapland, uh, um, Skold Sami particularly, who tell a story of uh, a woman uh, spending a winter in a bear's cave and then. In spring, she came forth and produced the clan of the Sami. So here we have a concrete uh, founding myth connected with the bear of a Uralic tribe. Also, the Obe Ugrik, the Mansi and Hanti of Siberia, they have very elaborate uh, bear funerals. Many of the, the tribes and clans trace ancestry to the bear. Uh, and interestingly, even though we don't have uh, specifically explicit uh, information of any Finnish tribes tracing their origin to a bear. Uh, there is a striking similarity between the Ob Ugrik uh, and the Finnic uh, bear funeral rituals. There is a 17th century text from central Finland, the Vitasar text, uh, anonymous, uh, which uh, describes how a bear, when hunted, 
uh, was to be treated. The idea was that uh, when treated with respect and uh, placed appropriately uh, on a pine tree, the bear skull, the bear skull would ref uh, return to uh, the bear spirit would return to his uh, home in the heavens and come back again to live among humans. The Obugriks talk about the bear uh, being lowered in a golden cot uh, to the ground, which is also something as a motive which is very similar, identical actually, to the Finnic one. So there we can deduce from this that why else would uh, the, Finnic, uh, the Finns have preserved such text if uh, they didn't trace ancestry to the bear. So we have positivistic evidence of this from the Uruk. So we can, um, I'd say, very safely say that the Uralic people were very much a, a bear tribe, which spread bronze. And talking about Finnish mythology, uh, a dear child has many names. And uh, also in uh, in this case, uh, granted, uh, all of the names for the Finnish traditional religion, even in Finnish, are modern, because in ancient times, religion was synonymous with ethnicity. Every tribe had their own gods. There were a <coughs> clear understanding of which god was uh, which tribe, and when someone would say. In the Iron Age, I'm Finn, uh, it would imply automatically that this Finn would worship Finnish gods. So we'll, we talk about Suominusko, we talk about Kansanusko, we talk about Rafanusko, first meaning Finnish belief, Suominusko, the other one being Kansanusko, meaning folk belief, uh, Rafanusko, vernacular belief. Uh, there are two ways of understanding this uh, folk belief in uh, modern academic literature of the topic. Uh, the broader one being uh, the whole religion even from before contacts with Christianity up until the modern times and then the uh, more stricter definition being that uh, the, everything uh, after contact with Christianity uh, is a uh, is a folk belief. I I am very much against this kind of uh, chronological division, uh, which, which I consider to be quite arrogant from a uh, uh, not Christian but uh, Christian background uh, academic literature, referring also to the Vita Sala text of the 17th century. Uh, it's from the 17th century, so according to even the stricter definition of false belief would have some kind of Christian influence, but there is no Christian influence at all. Unless uh, we want to say that, well, Jesus was hung on a cross, very rare skull is hung on a tree, pine tree, but it doesn't imply that it's Christian influence, especially since we know that the Obogooks of Siberia did the same. So. Uh, we can say safely that um, there has been an understanding of uh, the religion being uh, different from Christianity. These are two uh, symbols of the religion. This is called uh, an ukkolvasara, hammer of ukko, the thunder god. Uh, more or less similar in function and symbol as Mjolnir, the Germanic thunder god's symbol. This is a slightly more elaborate version, combining the Ukon Vasara uh, with the mountain in the center of the world on which there is a pillar of the sky holding the sky in place, where there is, uh, this can be either a tree of life uh, or the pole star, which keeps the pillar in place around which the heaven uh, swirls. And we know that uh, uh, this uh, is a very old uh, symbol. These are Iron Age finds from cemeteries in Finland. Uh, there have also been molds, uh, casts found with uh, either one of these symbols on one side 
and the Christian cross on the other side. So the Smiths would uh, do as the customer demanded. So some customers wanted a Christian cross and the other was a Finnish symbol. And then talking about the Finnish mythology, uh, there are some features which uh, are similar to the European traditions, some which are very unique. One very unique feature of Finnish mythology is the idea that the world is created from an egg. Uh, in Kalevala, the, the bird which lays an egg uh, is a sotka, which I can't remember now, a, a duck, related to a duck. Let's say sotka, a duck. This is by Josef Alanen, uh, an early 20th century uh, artist, uh, depicting an eagle. And in some variations of the, the poems, it's, uh, it can be an eagle, also it can be a swallow. So any bird uh, which lands on uh, the knee of uh, Vainamonen uh, lays its eggs on the knee, the knee gets uh, warm, Vainamonen moves his knee, and the eggs fall and crack, and then Vainamonen uh, orders that the upper part of the egg shall be the heavens and the lower shall be the underworld. The egg yolk shall be the uh, sun, the egg white shall be the moon, and all the brown wheats in the egg shall be the stars. So this is the creation of the world. Uh, Kalevala, uh, as a 19th century project in uh, modern uh, active nation building, has changed the narrative a little bit. It's not Vainamonen, it's Ilmatara. But when we look at the original sources, the poems connected in the 19th century, it's Vainamonen. There's no mention of Ilmatara at all. And coming I mean, we're talking about this egg as a concept of the uh, world creation. I mean, Germanic uh, concept is that of a primordial giant. Uh, also uh, related to Yama and Manu in, uh, in, in Indo-Iranian mythology. The, so we don't see any cultural contact with neighbors uh, in this myth. Uh, the closest that uh, this Estonian uh, folklorist Ilovalk has found are mythology of southeastern China. Uh, well, there is a story of Banku as the primordial uh, giant creator um, cracking the world egg open and creating the world. So there is something very ancient uh, with this myth. And here we see a picture of a forest fin uh, worshipping a tree god. Forest fins uh, lived in uh, the western Swedish and eastern Norwegian uh, uh, what's it? wilderness uh, from the late 16th, uh, early 17th century onwards. They were uh, encouraged by the Swedish uh, crown to settle these areas which were mostly uninhabited at the area at the time and they preserved a lot of mythology as well uh, very archaic in structure uh, one archaic feature which I like to mention here uh, is uh, the use of the sacred language so the, there's a meter called the uh, Galavala meter the runometer, which is the form in which the creation of the world and other sacred songs have been passed down. Uh, as you saw in the linguistic slide about Uxi, it was a two-syllable word, uh, which is a very uh, old structure of the language. And this meter preserves the structure of the language better than the spoken language. And this, this uh, has been said to be possibly from uh, contacts with the Balts. But the Samoyeds in Siberia have a sacred language which is also 
uh, preserving a similar two-syllable word structure. So it could have uh, been developed already in Siberia and then enhanced with contacts with the Balts and the Dinas, but uh, these are still theories. That would be it from me for now. I uh, hope this has been uh, uh, interesting and you've learned some more uh, about the Finns and their origin. <coughs> and once again, happy Kindred People's Day. All right, so now it's time for art. So I did this uh, lecture actually in Art Academy last year, but I changed it up. And changed it up actually for uh, one big, I changed it last night, for one big reason. So yesterday we went to the Art Museum right next to the train station here in Helsinki. And I have nothing, to, nothing positive to say. So the paintings were there. It was really, 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 really fun to see the paintings in real life. How they were painted, you can see strokes and everything. It's beautiful. But there were no telling anything. They were all over the place. But they, they retold the story, fitting a narrative of today, like love or whatever the hell the stories were about. And then just throwing pictures like random here, random here, another room, random there, random there. So there's no actual history of the paintings themselves, why they were made, who they were, who is uh, Galen Kalela. That's a real question, who is he? Uh, nothing. Like, I, I asked one of the Sumers, it's like, how does he look like? Oh, big, probably big black guy, I think, so all things are black, no? But no. So that's what we're going to talk about. So the, the change is simply the forgotten aspect. But it's, it's a little fun first, but we, we, we start with this one. So if you wonder who Galela is, that's Galela. What is this? Uh, uh, and these three are Finland's most important composers. This is obviously a more humoristic piece, that's why I picked it in the beginning, so everybody can see that there's a lot of jokes when it comes to this area as well, especially with the uh, Galen, but the actual more proper photo is this one, with actually not looking like little trolls. Yeah, and these are the three composers. I, put, I didn't have it in the first time, but I put it in here so everybody knows who they are. And uh, um, Sibelius, uh, Finlandia, fin Finlandia, I think it is, is a masterpiece. But yeah, I was talking a little bit about the art museum and the point of a lot of these paintings during this period. So uh, let's talk quickly about this one because it kind of symbolizes a lot of the purpose of the type of art during this time. So here you have uh, Finland in the woman, you know, and always gotta be woman. You have the, the law, which is a Swedish law that you guys used, and then you have the two-headed eagle, which is Russia. So during Nikolai II's time, they wanted to Russify Finland. And this is sort of the, symbol but maybe it's, it's gonna make you have a feeling for it it's like they're taking away from the beautiful innocent woman her law our law these evil Russians and then you see the thunder and so it evokes emotions and this is I think this was declared one of the most important paintings during the time just because of how raw it is with, with emotion and the understanding is decently simple to understand so, to give you an idea how the Art Academy, or Art Museum, had it uh, pointed out, they didn't have this one because that's not, they, not in their donation. Let's say, let's take this one, let's say they had this one. So they have this one, maybe the description is life. They describe the, the meaning of life. And next to it, they had a postmodern one from maybe the 40s, looking like this. A big man with a big schlong. You know, the schlong, uh, so that, that's me, that's my schlong. <laughs> it could be right next to it, like this. And then it's like, how am I supposed to get the feeling of this when I see a man with a big schlong right next to it? It's like a postmodern art garbage. It's just right next to it and it, it, it takes you out of it. It takes you out of the points of these imageries. And the point of these imageries is, really funnily enough, what you mentioned, it's, it's reconstruction. A lot of it is what is Finland. It's, 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 it's a question that uh, Patrick started with. It's a simple question, I guess. Like, what is a Finn? 
And a lot of these paintings is to point out what is a film, but in simplistic and naturalistic terms, because natural realism was the main uh, form that took place in 1918 in Finland. Uh, but yeah, and so I guess in a sense I'm doing the same mistake the first time I did the lecture. Uh, to cutting them up into different categories. But I'd like to do this uh, just to get an understanding of where the focuses were in natural realism a lot. It were uh, the religious, started in the beginning with Christianity. I'm going to show you a lot of examples of nuns, of uh, Jesus or Maria, uh, and, yeah, and the holiness and the cleanliness and a lot of yellow colors. Uh, the Patriotic, which was in the beginning aspects with Nikolai II, and uh, in the later period when the war started and the Golden Age also kind of died out in the 1980s, when uh, most of these artists became propaganda artists instead of just drawing for wanting to do it, having patriotism. And that is, yeah, because of the, when they got independence in 1918, the Civil War in the 1990s, and then the conflict later on. And the realistic, this is the thing that fascinated me the most. It is very simple things. It's nothing grand, it's nothing great, it's nothing <laughs> extraordinary. And I'm going to show you later with, with Gallen, like, he made massive, massive pieces describing stories of the uh, um, Kalevala. But one can say his most important image is a boy looking at a bird. And one of the words, at least it's fascinating, but I'll show you later when I'm talking to more about Gallo. So this one, uh, not this version, but funny thing, this, another version of this existed in the Art Museum with Alexander I, no uh, learn route, and just imagery. And I put the, now I know a little bit more why they have this imagery. It's, it's about the time periods that they're in. So the, the ones that existed in the art museum is a recreation from objects. So they had different Finnish, was it, things he used and then he just recreated it. Then they had Alexander I, which is the period of 1860, 1830, I don't know, whatever it was. Uh, Alexander, not Alexander II, what was it? Yeah, Alexander II. There's Alexander II. Yeah, that's Alexander II, and Alexander III, and Nikolai, yeah. But this is, um, would have been around right before Nikolai, so 18, 18, this is 1870. And uh, the interesting part about this, this is sort of tells the time of who is important for the average Finnish household. It is the king, and it is uh, the identity and who we are, which is in Lundvud, the man who wrote Kalevala, which is uh, stories, uh, different stories of uh, more Karelian paganism that he took by going to the middle parts of Finland, uh, writing it down, and then going back, and then everybody's angry at him. But hell, did you just talk to those little guys there, not all of us? And that therefore there was a little bit of error in it. But the point was to unify. It's like, this is, we are all equal. Here's our stories from this side, here's our stories from this side. All right, so I'm going to talk about, well, these four. But mostly three in particular, but this is for you to get an insight of the time period. So, Adolf von Becker, he, started, he was in active mode in the 1860s, but he was sort of the, the creator of the art academies. Not great, but he was a big part of the art academies in Finland. He created different uh, study groups, and most of these guys had him as a teacher. He didn't focus on natural realism, he focused on another form, we can talk about very soon, which is um, the era right before natural realism. So the era was, uh, was proper, it was clean, not scars in the face, sort of uh, halfly romanticizing reality, but not otherwise. Uh, but anyways, Albert Edelfeld, one thing as well, many of these are sweets, but that's besides the point. Albert Edelfeld would be one of the most important ones. He's the one who brought natural realism as an art form into Finland and taught a lot of the people natural realism. He went to Paris to study and took it from Dusseldorf. No, I wasn't Dusseldorf. 
regardless, he is a European realistic form. Brought it into Finland and everybody starts uh, using that form. And Albert is, uh, as the art museum actually said, Albert Elofeld's temporary gallery was the most popular temporary gallery in, in Finland, I think, ever, with 300,000 visitors. It's very fascinating, but he is incredibly important. And uh, to give you an insight a little bit on how he was active, when he was in Paris, he studied with the greats. And uh, for example, there is uh, an imagery like where the Roman suit come from. It's actually uh, in, in, in a photo by a Parisian guy, a French guy, I don't remember his name, uh, where they do, you know, halfway in front of multiple swords. This is where that came from. So in that influence of that photo in history, is, we already know it's quite, quite grand. He, he was friends with him. He was friends with that poet, uh, the painter. So again, gives you a bit of an insight. Uh, Jammerfeld I'm going to talk about, and Kalle I'm going to talk about. Could be an interruption. Can you move the, thing, the whole thing back so I can get you both together? No, yeah, don't, you don't need to have all of this, it's fine. Right, so I'm trying to get it... Even if it cuts off a little bit, I'm explaining it, so it's, 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 it's all fine. Right. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to quickly go into it, not too much in detail, because we're going to skip a little bit. Um, so this is the, the form that he used. So it, this is not realism. This is a... a you can see the, 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 it's real in a sense, but you can see how clean the faces are. This is sort of right before it. So it, it, this was the one who started. It's in the school, the open school. Um, not the main European realistic schools, but a bit of its own. But it's sort of, it, the, the more realism came from it, maybe ah, in a sense of laziness, because this takes ages to draw. Um, again, first teacher. Me, um, f through Gallen and a few other people we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and in later life, he actually moved to St. Petersburg and he was a teacher there, which is uh, incredibly grand. Uh, if you uh, study in St. Petersburg, even today, <laughs> your entire life needs to be about painting. Uh, can I talk about Ilfeld real quick as well? Uh, so, this is. Uh, a painting from a song, a rally song. Uh, well, the rally, yeah, 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 I can say that. But it, more or less, this painting is from when Sweden lost Finland. The boys being out marching against the Russians when they were coming, which they sadly lost. And there's a uh, poem that uh, was uh, later also used for the Finns when they marched on, uh, more or less, what they sang when they marched. So this is the painting just about that conflict, but about a, a marching song, more or less. Bjorn Boynas Marsh. And uh, his school that he used was the Dusseldorf School of uh, Painting. So his start was a lot with, as I said, the religious aspect, the Catholic, Christian religion, a lot of, uh, more popular in southern Mediterranean focuses, but it came to Finland together with the people who went to Paris. But then little, little, little by little this changes was more popular because that's what gave you money. You wanted money. Changed little by little by still Christian. Still, but a little bit more about everyday usage of Christianity. This can be, you can see later you're going to chat when you're doing something like this. So this is still everyday, but this is still a little bit, it's not naturalistic realism, but it's still, it's getting to that form. And a lot of this is a propaganda purpose. This one with pillaging off a village in the back while the Finns are hiding. This one, I sadly don't remember on top of my head, but this painting is extremely important, especially in Swedish history uh, um, and Finnish history as well. It's a Finnish king, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, I don't remember this on top of my head. I read it before. Uh, I forgot it. Uh, Fleming, uh, who was uh, in charge of uh, quelling the uprising in Finland against the king, uh, he was the earl, not the king, and uh, they were rivals. And he uh, tugged Fleming's <coughs> beard in the funeral, which was an insult. <laughs> yeah, but this is. Um more older style, but it's uh, 
gorgeous. And he did a lot of these types of paintings as well, which is uh, from the king. So Nikolai II hired a lot of people to draw, and Edelfeld was one of the best, so he hired Edelfeld to draw. And again, uh, this man, as we all know how he ended up being, was a tyrant, more or less, for the Finns. They hated him. I think if it wasn't for Nikolai's wanting Russification, I don't think Finland would have an opportunity to become independent. The struggle was there. Well, uh, Alexander II did right. Yes, but here comes the more uh, the natural, the, the more important aspect that that this image is what sort of everybody had to follow. Now in Finland, this is what everybody draws. So what is this? Well, it's a simple life. It's just two fishermen. Well, fishermen's daughter and fisherman. Being out, the, being out the sea. It's still very beautiful. It's very high class because he. Is that it's his tradition he has to do so. He has to always one up himself of sorts because he was a nobleman who was poor, who had to always fight. Well, that's why it's so much detail, but the details kind of disappear a little, but little, but little, but little, but little. But the point was simple stuff. Much more simple stuff. This one, the reason why I put this one in because uh, when I did the first uh, video on that, uh, on Finnish art. Oh. Someone contacted me and said, oh, I have this original photo. And I thought about this one when I was in the art uh, museum as well. It's like, maybe you could give it to the art museum, was my first thought. But when I walked around, do not give it up. Keep, keep it. Because the way you tell the story, the way you recreate the story, is not, it shouldn't be from a modern, more or less destructive thing, but it should be kept. Like an image in and of itself, and the way and the reason should talk about itself. I don't need no modern person telling me, oh, you see her blouse? No, shut the fuck up. Uh, yes, yeah, I So this is one of the other paintings. This is painted by Galen. For little fun, but you got another very important painting. This. It was beautiful to see this one actually in the museum, but uh, I think the only information was a little, little thing on the side. You're saying the name of it, not what's happening, not what the point, what they're doing. It's really sad. So what they're doing is, uh, this is a tree going back far, 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 far. The burning forest down to later create farmland. Uh, but this, especially for an urbanite in Helsinki, probably lost that tradition quite a lot. Like, why would you burn a forest down probably? But now you can see it, and you can see it for what it actually is. A lot of soot, a lot of hard work, labor, and it's just, you know, it immediately gets an understanding of this is also my people. You now this is the Finnish people in another part of the, of the land that has to do with tradition I've done for so long. Now I can see it. And it's a grand photo. Oh, I'm painting a photo. <laughs> but one thing, this is uh, one to talk about as well. I find it very interesting with this and what you have talked about, what both of you have talked about when it comes to Finnish history and ethnogenesis. It's about um, also collective memory. So, most. How do you say it? I studied uh, in university a little bit about collective memory. It's the stories of the people. Um, a lot of these images is just recreation of cultural memories or, or memories of people, of, of the task that they do. So it's nothing extraordinary, it's just remembering who you were, the memories of your ancestors, the memories of your father, the memories of your grandfather, and just putting it into a, a, a way to make it more alive. So it's not just verbal tradition, it becomes another sort of tradition. So if we take Lundgren, what he did in, um, in the Koreans as well, we talking to them, he, he recreated a verbal tradition, so he recreated a, a memory into another form. In the sense that this, this can be very destructive for the verbal tradition, but it's still, it's still logging it, still keeping it, still saving it. And then that takes so diff it, it takes meaning to a different form because now you have a different form. You can see your own cultural memories, own cultural 
tremendous. I'm going to go through the paintings a little bit again so you can see what type of uh, paintings Jan Felt drew. I like this one personally because it fits the darkness of the alcoholic speaks to me. <laughs> yeah, nice. And it's another comment here about uh, that I got that uh, Jan Felt is, yeah, it's a Norman. Most of these were Norman because it cost a lot of money to become a painter. It changed also during this time a little bit that everybody could be a painter, which is also creates other issues. So, yeah, isn't it? So there's a lot of images out there that are not known, but I don't want to give them to a museum who can't upkeep their memory, who doesn't know why those paintings were drawn. Now, now I thought about another thing that I absolutely fucking hate. Again, with, with re reconstruction, okay, it's really hard to do. Again, you can't, they're reconstructing memories with a lot of these images, but there's another interesting aspect. So I went to an art museum in Sweden, where they had uh, Sweden's most famous painter. He had schizophrenia. So he was uh, doodling on his sketchbook. And the doodles themselves used doodles, such as his schizophrenia, or whatever he has in his head. So what they wanted to do to painters, they wanted to recreate these schizophrenic doodles into art. And I've never seen a bigger middle finger to a man than I have there. Because they didn't do it with like passion or like, okay, let's actually if, the, if he drew a woman, let's actually draw how, the way he drew in a proper way. What he actually, this sketch could have been like. So, a recreation of the actual thing. No, 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 no. It was... It was lazy, pathetic doodling. Like, the doodles were there, but then it's like... Face, no face, just... Big straws. Ugly ass imagery. And if you can have ugly ass imagery, it's no point. Don't, don't do it. So we're going to talk about Garland here a bit again. And, uh, again, I just love this. The lovers speaks for itself. And um, with Garland, he was um, a lot of his imagery. This is the, the thing I was talking about. One of the famous one. Uh, it's just a boy looking at a crow. Or oh, was it a raven? Oh, uh, it's a crow. It's a crow. <laughs> You know, it has the white thing that you, you don't have in England. Yeah. And he's in uh, Tirana, which is a small little village in central Finland. So he did a lot of his first naturalistic drawings because he was he spent a lot of his youth in Tirana. And he took this with him everywhere he went. So this this image from a little village in Tirana, in middle Finland, came to Paris and became a big part of the the art scene in Paris, weirdly enough. And I have a few other images just the same. A woman and her cat. A Finnish woman with the cat. And again, the weird part is, okay, you, you, I know, who cares? But at this time, you need, need to understand, Finland was not independent. What was a Finn wasn't answered, really. You kind of forgotten that, that, that part quite a lot. So simple imagery like this gave an answer to, what's a Finn? It's just like, that's one with a cat. So it's like this, it's a recreation of, of, of I don't know, answering of that question, what is a film, in simple terms without destroying it. And it's, it's important to do that. It's important to draw the mundane in a sense because it gives you an understanding of who you are, of what a film is. And, and, and the history of it, and the history of the people, the, their ethnos, you name it, you name it. I'm just going to go through and show the different images that I have from him. I don't, I don't, I can't comment much, this is the funny thing, I can't comment much on these photos because they are, there you go, these photos are not they can speak for themselves. This is a song, with a bunch of naked ladies. Uh, yes. And then, uh, Callan went through many phases of his life, the way he painted. Uh, that's his wife, on the left there. I won't show her off. <laughs> But uh, Kalen changed a lot also depending on his family life. So he traveled a lot, he was everywhere, he wrote to everybody. Oh, another aspect, uh, speaking right to everybody, he wrote to Strindberg, which is uh, during the time Sweden's most important uh, painter, not painter, um, novelist, who wrote many, 
I think he one can describe him as like, um, like the creator of a certain uh, kind of like chronicle, what's that called, or whatever type type of text, uh, and. Uh, Steinmeier was very much a part of Swedish nationalism at the time, which was Goetheism, which is that the Gothic people, uh, central Swedes, not the Swedes, but the central, were the best type of people. They conquered the entire world, more or less, with Visigoths and Goths in the name. And what they wanted to do during this time is to annex Finland, at least the, the cultural aspect of, of, of Finland, uh, so of Swedes wanted to take over Finland again. So they need to constantly justify themselves on why Finland needs to be independent, not part of Sweden or Russia. It's also a justification of independence. And Kallen or Gallen wrote a lot to Steinbeier just also for that justification. And there were a lot of other artists during this time that also did the same thing, trying to justify. So I, I talked about uh, jokingly about Vitor Aspa at one point, who wrote that uh, Finns are actually from Egypt. Uh, but the point of that was not so much that they're actually from Egypt. The point of that is to justify their own existence. And he wrote this thing by as well, trying to say, we are our own people, leave us alone. Let us be us, because we're special, we came from Egypt. But no, no, no need. But the, the fin Finnish political class didn't want to annex Finland. But it's still a thing that has to constantly be justified on why you should be independent. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then a little later in his life, 1890-something, he started uh, focusing on uh, rewriting the stories of Kalevala. This is the creation of the Samp Sampi? Sampi? Sampo. Huh? Sampo. Sampo. I've eaten everything. I'm not a master of that story and I'm not going to retell it, so I can show you the imagery that he made. And the funny thing about Galvin as well, like, you see this imagery, it's like you think, oh, was he the first one? No, no, he wasn't the first one. He was just the best one, and then he killed the career of everybody else who, who wrote about or drew anything from Kalevala. And yeah, you, you, you're gonna see you see the symmetry everywhere here. Because this is uh, the story exists. How does it look like? Well, this is how it looks like. And he got this one of the the witch's army that's in her in her back fighting over the Sampo that fell in the ocean. And the Sampo is a, it's an, it's an infinity machine that has salt, grain, and gold okay, going out of it constantly. It's an infinite amount. So very important to, to not to drop in the ocean. It's another one. This one we saw in the art museum as well. Don't know what the story is about. Again, I very, 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 know a little bit about Kalevala, but it's gorgeous, and the story of it is actually here in Finnish. But again, it's, a re it's, it's, in, it's showing in pictures what the story is. It's like, um, yeah, it's, it's like a white man's YouTube video. Three hour long uh, video essay about something that you can read on Wikipedia. It's the same sort of aspect. Nah, jokingly. <laughs> so I did this as a joke when I wanted to do it. It was like, oh, he's Galen. I mean, I can't show him. The art scene didn't show him. That's him, that's him, that's a, it's a straw man, no, it's a stick man. Nah, I'm, I'll show the image later. And uh, yeah, this is his um, drawing of um, Mannerheim. He worked for Mannerheim as a propaganda artist, making sigils, markings on the coats, and other propaganda imagery. Yeah, as I've been talking, that, that's his actual name, Axel. Got it. Message. Uh, more or less, again, the joking was yes, that the art museum didn't talk about it. So well, who was he? And the thing is, I don't, when I did this the first time, I didn't have all these skull and imagery for the same reason is how do you describe him? How do you describe such an eccentric man who is, was in Paris and part of the World Fair, drew imagery, destroyed the careers of everyone around him, became the main focus of everything, and was a big propaganda artist of wars later on, like the civil war, but later on when the actual winter was going to happen, a lot of his imagery would probably still be used, at least be some. And also this one is funny. And same with uh, Maxim Gorky, because uh, when uh, Gorky was exiled from Russia, 
he went to uh, his studio, Gallen's studio, and uh, hid there for two years. And it was Maxim Gorky. Well, Maxim Gorky is a really bad novelist, <laughs> uh, writing about his mother. Nah, joking. Now, but he's um, sort of the first, or I should say, main uh, cultural icon or cultural creator of the early Soviet period, uh, writing a protolet, protolet, proletarian art. Proletarian. Proletarian art. The work is the workman's art in a social realistic. Uh, fashion. So the story of his mother is the story of him and his childhood being a poor man, being a, a poor boy in a little farming community, having to survive. His mother struggling, and this could then it didn't, it didn't resonate with most people. Uh, but um, this is the story that the Soviets, Soviets wanted to tell. It's that without us, you're poor. It's recreating a story again. For without us, it's poor, and they use maxims. But the funny thing about him, so, so in a sense, actually speaking of that, in a sense these two are very similar because they're both recreating a story. One is more, yeah, one is more about Finland and one is about the worker. But the funny thing about him, Stalin loved him, most people loved him. And everybody that, that Max and Gorky worked for, or so, so studied with, died. And not through natural causes. And that's sort of how he got his fame in the Soviet Union as well. It's anybody who didn't like him, or anyone who didn't write like him, or similar to him. This is just uh, this is his gallant's artwork. So um, this is still actually how it is, good enough. In art academies, especially with uh, focus on realism, there's still going to be naked people that have to draw. Why naked people? Because it's really hard to draw a human body. In shadows and its imperfections. So, uh, in the. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I was having this uh, talk as well, there. On the side, in the front, and behind the, this projector screen, naked men. <laughs> naked men and women. Penises all over the place, so it's kind of like, ah. But people actually get paid to do this type of job, and really not a lot of people do it because, I mean, they take it home and they, I guess. Fun to see your body being painted. Like, I don't. I find it very weird when you do it. But yeah, there's still not as many because now it's expensive. Yeah, probably expensive, but it's very common to still draw like this. And Gallen was in, is in this imagery, somewhere hiding. I think it's might be in there. And this is him hopping hop sex. <laughs> Again, I wanted to reframe his story so you can you can tell the story. Yeah, it's just an old man you know, jumping hop sex. No, actually, this is. This is uh, actually a tradition uh, they do once a year, sort of like a celebration. And this is just him celebrating that celebration where you're dropping hop sacks. And this is him in an army uh, uniform. Then it became a big part. And, 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 and again, um, you can say this as well, like if, if the whites, if the, if the nationalistic Russia, uh, Finland, the Finns didn't have the, the culture with them, like Galen had, they most likely would have also lost. And why? Well, in Sweden, for example, there was a coup d'etat in the 1910s. But it wasn't actually a coup d'etat. It was a coup d'etat, but not on paper. But it was a coup d'etat. And how did they make it? was the Social Democrats taking over. How did they manage to do that? Well, they controlled the culture. Every poet, every painter, everybody romanticized the social democratic project. So everybody talked about it, everybody wrote about it, and then it became acceptable. And it became so acceptable, the king said, wait, hey, 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 hold on a moment here. And we are not commies. So he, he took his army, was supposed to oust the army in the, uh, in the, 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 the Social Democrats in the parliament. And then the army said, nah, we like them. And then they ousted the king. Made him only a puppet. No, not what I say. Made him, we made it to a sort of constitutional monarchy without the king having any power. And he could do that only because they could control the culture. You are more imagery. This is him painting um, the roof. And this is a story from Kalevala. This is the image that I had in the beginning and made a joke. Yeah, this is a big, big roof complex that he's painting. 
So he's, he's standing uh, not on the ground. And yeah, learn the route. I'm not going to talk too much about learn the route, more in the sense that uh, it's goes back to what you talked about with migrations and stories <laughs> uh, collected in a poetry sample or in a, in a book brought to the cities and uh, able to retell. But they weren't, as I said, they weren't fully correct. But if, if not for this man, and, and we, we, uh, the hotel that most of us stay in, it's named after Lundwurt as well, because he's extremely important for the, for the construction of the Finnish state. Yeah. Do I have to tell the, the story of Finland? Are you that creative? I don't think you people need to hear that. I think most of you guys know what happened. Oh, 1917. I was thinking 1918. It's 1917. Regardless. <laughs> oh, yeah, but one thing that is funny about this story... Okay, okay, just get the years a little bit more. One thing that's funny about the story is uh, Medvedev, the, the former president of uh, Russia, he wrote on his Twitter a little while ago, is, you, you, and he, he had an AI-generated photo of a Finn being very, very fat. And he says, oh, you guys should not forget who gave you independence. It was Lenin. It's like, yeah? And this, the Russian had a civil war. He asked Lenin, could we actually become uh, the only country? He said yes, because they had a parliament, they had an entire system set up. He said yes, for only the year afterwards, for the, the, the communists to support a, a civil war in the country. <laughs> so it's not like... It, wasn't, it was independence, yes. That's only because it was more fruitful for the Russians not to have the Finns attack St. Petersburg, which they can do within a day if uh, there was a war. But in a sense, one can joke, like, if... Uh, Finland did not become independent, most likely the Reds will have lost in Russia. Yeah, it became propaganda. Yeah, um, also another thing that's very important with this, with this imagery, uh, that is um, not to be forgotten also. Um, this imagery was used as justification for the rest of the world on why Finland is a nation, its own country. So in the 1900s, was it 19? 1900s? Yeah, I think you say that. You don't say anything when it's... Yeah. There was a um, world fair in Paris. And uh, there's... Finland being a nation at this time, them having their own pavillon, their own little area where they can show their stuff, it's quite odd, not used, not but why in the first place. But it did, and they actually won so many awards because it was new, it was from a different country, it was a in that country, in a different area, it was, it got a justification. Now everybody will see you as your own independent nation, which you, which they have pretty much never been. But this in a way gave it, yeah, Finns, this, they, you need, wow, Finns, wow, so, so many new things that people haven't seen before. Yeah, roof is made by God. So I'm just going to go a little bit into some, some people that were there, but other important people during the time, and I'm very soon done, because I'm not going to talk too, too much. I'm just going to show imagery. And the funny thing is, well, I, uh, a lot of these people who drew these were women, which, <laughs> take it as you wish. But they're good. I'm just going to go through them very quick. You can see. Yeah, she won a bronze medal. And yeah, she became in. It was a yearly newspaper. I don't remember newspaper. It was that this woman got woman uh, woman painter in the world. So like the most one of the most most important women painter in the entire world came from Finland. Again, I cannot skip most of these. I just give you an idea. Gunnar. Again, these people seem handy. Many of these I can just talk about for half an hour. Just them. But I am seeing my time is running out and I want to finish. Did it? So I'm just going to go through them. Let them speak for themselves for a little bit. This was, uh, this is not natural realism, this was beforehand, it was before, but this was still an uh, interesting photo that was uh, shared around quite a lot. It takes a while to draw these. It'll take up to a year. 
Yeah, th this image, weird enough, uh, they didn't have it in the art, uh, art museum, but they had uh, just a fucking painted picture of it hanging, just like fucking copy, copy paper. Uh, yeah, modernist. But yeah, ex this is the expressionalism. So it's not the, 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 it's an expression that reality gives you. It's not about reality. It's about what you see from it and what you get. Impressionism. Emo. Yeah. No, impressionism is is the okay. it's the expression of reality, not reality itself. So many uh, speaking of re realism it can be very interesting. So to become a, a Painter, usually it's a nine years of education, and you start from uh, being baby. Now you start from being like nine or something. Uh, most of what you do is um, still life, so you have to draw this, and this is what you do for multiple years, and you get better and better and better with shadows. Uh, but there are different forms that you can draw the same thing. Uh, most with natural realism or realism is to just draw what's in front of you. Draw this, don't add anything up. There's another form uh, of realism, that's the Dutch form. It's, for example, don't draw what's in front of you, draw what you imagine in front of you. So still draw the same thing, but don't draw it from this, draw it from, I like, see it, but analyze, analyze it, then draw it, not just draw it. And th different things like that ch changes the entirety of, of, of the art, artworks. Oh yeah, um, I got the question as well. Uh, how did this be? How is this being spread to the common man? It's mostly being spread by military, for example, the music of God and the rest, but also by teachers. So uh, both of these paintings were more and more being spread out in schools and being taught in schools. So they can have like a, maybe uh, in the classroom you can have like a, a photo of, of one of these paintings maybe, and that's how it can spread. And this woman was a painter, but also. Uh, uh, started a different school of uh, drawing for youths. Coffee point. Uh, this painting gets famous and part of a commercial. Made a rich. <laughs> and has been remade many times after the fact. I'm just going to show you the uh, paintings. In the middle. I like this one. It's a, uh, what is it? Yeah, the child hospital. Little chunky baby in the back. Yeah. yeah she's a student of uh, the first guy, von Becker. Uh, and this is like, she ended up with this type of inventory, which I find a bit lazy, but it's. It's also because the, the time it takes to draw properly lost its focus, lost its steam. You didn't get as much money in the law, so you kind of like, eh, gotta move it. But you made this one, which you saw in the uh, Art Academy. Life, this girl trying to bring forth a tree, having water in the cup and putting the little seedling in the cup. And what she's gonna do later is to plant it, but she's trying to get it to root. Life. This one was also in the art uh, museum. Uh, Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. It's not sweet at all. Mm. I like this woman. The funny thing about her is like, to, to point out how famous the Finnish artists during this time is, kings throughout Europe hire these people to paint, like the uh, Italian king, Umberto. The funny thing about her is like how global this became, that multiple other men from many different countries wanted to have sex with them. And she married an Italian, uh, took, her, took his last name. But the funny thing about uh, that's this Italian, he couldn't keep it in his pants, so he had a sexual relation with another one of uh, Finland's greatest women painters. This would be him and her, I guess, autobiography. Uh, auto. I was kind of a new for yourself, whatever. I let them speak for themselves.
my time is pretty much up, so I'm just gonna. Yeah, this is the, this is the one. The uh, uh, oh, her name is not there. It's uh, uh, Dora Vargas. This is a woman he had a relationship with. Yeah, Gunnar, another one of the guys were her teacher. You can see this. Uh, it's just a celebration. It happens once again in Finland. I don't know what it's called, but. I was a get together during the summer. Summer solstice, probably. And this is the last. Simplicity. Beautiful. But the point of this is. A lot of this, like the the reason why I find these things interesting, is because this is what also creates nature. This imagery, it's imagery. And the funny thing is, I, for example, wanted to do uh, one thing on the Danish golden age. It was after 19, oh, 1910s, uh, sorry, 1810s to 1862 or four, when the second uh, Schleswig Holstein war happened. So I, I, I looked into their artists. I looked into them and they were fascinating, beautiful, it was, they were beautiful uh, na natural landscapes of the common folk life. Then I go to Denmark, go to the museums, go to schools and there's nothing there. Many of these modern nations, they're completely forgetting who they were, who they are, by not actually showing history or retelling history into a way to fit the modern standard, which is, uh, I guess, global modernity, which is just nasty. But something to always remember when it comes to, to, to culture and paintings, it's incredibly important. And again, I mean, it's more when you see it without its context. But if, if you go back and imagine yourself being a little peasant in the 1920s and seeing these grand things about your own nation, that's how you go to war. <laughs> That's how you can feel that patriotism to actually maybe, let's say, start a nation or do something. Like, no wonder people today are so pessimistic. There's nothing, nothing grand to see. Everything is about destruction. Anyways, thank you very much. <laughs>